for your lives. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone, to the um, June 23rd meeting of the California State Bar's Committee of Bar Examiners. Uh, I'm Paul Kramer, the this year's chair of the committee. Uh, we're here, and I want to thank, before I forget later, um, Loyola and Marymount University School of Law for offering us the use of their, um, I guess it's their moot court hearing room. Um, appears to be well set up for us to, to do as we always do to broadcast our meetings and have some of our members participate by Zoom. Um, we'll get to public comment in a minute, but first, um, let's take the roll. Dr. Bolton? Here. Robert Brody? Here. Dr. Cow? Here. Alex Chan? Here. Jim Efting? Here. Kareem Gangora? Dolores Heisinger? Larry Kaplan? Here. Paul Kramer? Present. Alex Lawrence? Here. Esther Lynn, Bethany Peak, Ashley Silva Guzman here, Vince Reyes here, David Torres here. We have a quorum. Okay. Um, next uh, in order is is our public comment. Um, and for those of you who are viewing this meeting via Zoom, you can get closed captioning of the video feed. Um, if you'd like that. To do that, you would hover your mouse over the lower part of your screen where the Zoom toolbar is located. And in that toolbar, you'll find a section that's labeled CC for closed captioning. Just uh, select that item and then select show subtitles on the pop-up menu. Uh, for those of you who still have technical difficulties, please don't hesitate to contact State Bar staff for further assistance. If you're viewing this sometime later, uh, on the um, the recording that'll be posted uh, to um, the bar's website and uh, also I found on YouTube. Uh, there's a similar function in the YouTube viewer that will allow you to turn on captions. Um, but if you don't need the captions, I would uh, recommend that you don't turn them on because when we have presentations on the screen, they tend to cover the lower third of the screen and make it harder to see what's being presented. Uh, for public comment, um, the Board of Trustees has adopted a policy which applies to all bar committees, including this one. Its uh, policy statement says the State Bar of California welcomes public comment at all of its public meetings and appreciates listening to a wide variety of viewpoints that reflect the diversity of California. These public comment rules are designed to ensure that members of the public may exercise their right to be heard as well as ensure that the State Bar is able to fulfill its obligation to conduct business on behalf of the people of California in a timely fashion. Written public comments may be submitted to the email address on the meeting agenda, and we encourage you to submit written public comments at least 24 hours prior to the start of a meeting. Uh, comments that are received less than 24 hours prior to the start won't be distributed to the committee the committee until the next business day, which in this case would be Monday. If you bring written materials to a meeting for distribution, those will be collected by our uh, sec meeting secretary and again, distributed after the meeting concludes um, to avoid disruption of the meeting. Uh, for oral public comment, persons were encouraged to sign up to speak in advance of the meeting and we will call them in the order that they signed up. Persons who are attending the meeting here it will be call, called in the order they appear in the attendee list, um, which was available at the back of the room for you to sign up on. Um, those join us, joining us in the room today, oh, I already said that part, I'm sorry. Uh, speakers cannot concede their time to another speaker, and it is not guaranteed that all who wish to speak will be able to do so. Uh, to facilitate hearing from as many persons as possible, we encourage you not to repeat points that were made by a previous speaker, simply say that you agree with them. To allow the committee the time needed to, to deliberate on the important topics we will be discussing today, we will be limiting comments to three minutes per person. Law school deans or designated law school representatives may speak at the time their items are heard by the committee following staff's presentation for up to five minutes. Others who wish to speak in support of a school, say students or alumni, for instance, 
uh, must make their comments during this public comment window that we are about to open. If you're on Zoom with us and you want to speak, you'll need to raise your hand um, unless you were already on the sign-up sheet uh, 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 closed yesterday. Um, to do so, you click on the hand icon at the bottom center of your Zoom window. If you are participating just via telephone without your computer, you can raise your hand by pressing star and then nine on your telephone keypad. Our coordinator will call members of the public starting with the pre-meeting signups, then the Zoom list interspersed with the in-person signups uh, in the order that they signed up or raised their hands. Uh, staff will enable the microphone of the speaker and start our new on-screen timer when you begin to speak. If you uh, are on the telephone and you cannot see the timer and you'd like us to tell you when you have 30 seconds remaining, please let us know that when you begin speaking so we can do that for you. Um, I understand we have at least one sign up and I don't know if we have others in the room or on Zoom, but uh, Madam Coordinator, would you call the first person? Our first public comment will be from Benjamin Cohn. Hello and good morning. I'm disturbed that after I'd clarified at the March CBE meeting, the working group's confusion on TA rules revision comments it had received at the May board meeting, Ms. Dole made the same false claims while answering on point questions from Trustee Tony, particularly concerning extending the time limit to appeal to 30 days instead of 14 days from the current 10 days for decisions received at least that far in advance of the state bar's separate appeal cutoff of the first business day of the month. Ms. Dole repeated the same debunked claim that permitting 30 days could result in appeal submissions right before the exam, even though the continued operation of the exam month's first business day cutoff objectively forecloses her concern. Applicants should have at least 30 days to appeal if they petitioned at least two months before the exam, though alternatively, I wouldn't object to 14 days if the proposal were amended to make that deadline for a notice of appeal rather than a completed submission, as Ms. Dole claimed to trustee Tony it would be in contradiction to admi admonishments and present denial letters to applicants and lacking enumeration in the proposal. Ms. Dole also deflected Trustee Tony's question on the omission of the two weeks processing time limit by repeating the claim that the merits of that reform turn on the results of an experiment that would be years away. Taking action to shorten the present months of non-collaborative processing time to two weeks should not be tabled for years, merely to collect data on the extent to which the currently proposed reforms would allow such changes without expanding staff capacity, when even a finding that more staff capacity would be required would not absolve the necessity of implementing such a two-week processing time limit to providing disabled applicants with equal opportunity. You provide a hearing to all applicants who you consider at risk of being denied a positive moral character determination would be testing accommodation denials implicate the same liberty interest in a meaningful opportunity to practice a chosen profession and therefore deserve similar protections, even if only upon an appeal that cannot be granted on the papers. Current rules and presently proposed rules both prohibit provision of such a remedy and thus require amendment. Both the present proposal and the new forms impermissibly require attestation of exceptional need by treating experts and the applicant to request certain accommodations in contradiction of the governing best insurance level playing field legal standard, while repudiating any duty to provide individualized consideration of certain other disfavored accommodations in contradiction of express ADA re regulations. Worse, you're now proposing reviving the forced in-person policy and giving disabled applicants only one test site for statewide, regardless of where they live in the state, for both days while non-disabled applicants will be able to test remotely at least one day and at their region of the state for the test site they select uh, as a one of the options being prevent, presented for the cost cutting, this would disparately impact and disproportionately burden disabled test takers. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Ray Hayden. Thank you. Uh, Ray Hayden here. Um, <clears throat> I love that timer, by the way. Uh, I submitted written comments for this meeting, but due to, did I lose you? Hang on a no, second. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. All right, but due to the last minute update by Cal Bar, meaning the um, thing popped up on my thing after I had submitted my written comment, 
I really need to make a public comment as a flexibility of my suggestion. Uh, I live in Florida. Even if I take the written exam remotely, I still have to go to California for the MBE because that's where I'm allowed to sit for it. Uh, while that saves the California bar money, it saves me and others like me nothing and could cost us more. The MBE has known issues, but I won't go into that here. My point is that the suggestion I make does include multiple choice questions and quite a lot of them as need be. The difference is that the multiple choice questions I suggest aid in drilling the vital points and issues we must know cold as newly licensed California attorneys into our long-term memory. This program uh, can be up and running successfully by the February, uh, the February 2024 administration and certainly by July 2024. It would be remote in terms of being hosted in the portal that we use now anyway, and quizzes and exams, there would be quizzes too, that's in my notes that I sent. Quizzes and exams would be designed from the ground up to aid in getting this information into our long-term memory. Uh, for near instant recall, though I suggest uh, attorneys do their research. My suggestion would have the initial uh, would have initial startup car costs, of course, uh, but they'd be rather low, and the longer term benefits would be saving millions of dollars, especially based on the budget thing that I see is going to be presented here, uh, millions of dollars very quickly, if not instantly, and also allowing for actual income stream with only minor increases to the current, if any, fees for those uh, seeking admission. The program I suggest assures better protection for the general public, better than minimum competence, which I find insulting, and rock solid guarantees a more balanced and diverse California bar, uh, bar membership. I personally invite California bar staff uh, to contact me directly and begin discussions on how this works. I have done this before slightly differently, but that is the beauty of the flexibility of the program and the process. CalBar has my contact information. I'm available for discussions and insights. My desire is purely to fix the bar exam uh, mess, which has developed over a very, very long period of time. I have one more additional comment that is in my thing, but this is actually for the general public and people who might hear it on a recording later. The program I suggest already exists and anybody can research it. The Federal Aviation Administration does it. So it is possible they already do it. My commercial drone certification, because I make videos on YouTube using a drone, I have to have a commercial drone license. So because I have that, I have to take a written exam. I have to pass it with a 100% perfection every two years. It's recurrent drone um, uh, recertification uh, for my commercial license. Every two years, I have to take another test. I have to score 100%, 99% is failing, but 100% is passing. We can retake it uh, pretty much almost immediately, but we have to get the 100% or we, or we have to redo it. So there is something that's already in effect now. So I just wanted to thank you for your time and consideration. Have a great day. We have no additional um, online public comments. I'm sorry. No more online. No more. But any. Was there anyone person? in the room? Make a comment. Okay, let's see. We need to get her a microphone. Right here at the seat, right there. Just sit, sit right yes, there at please. the microphone would be perfect. How's that? Oh, everybody can hear me good? Thank you. Members of the committee, staff, thank you all for this opportunity to address the proposed fee increases related to the California accredited law schools. And we appreciate being able to attend in person. So nice to see everybody in person again. My name is Sandra Brooks. I'm the Dean at Cal Northern School of Law in Chico, California, and I'm also the co-chair of the California Accredited Law Schools. At a meeting held by the Cal's deans yesterday, many of whom are here with me today, in addition to the public comment we submitted on the Cal's behalf May 8th, the Cal's would again like to register our objection to the fee increases being imposed. While we recognize occasional regulatory fee increases may be part of every businesses operating reality, for the CALS to absorb increases of over 955% and 80% is unprecedented and is going to harm smaller schools and those students that the CALS serve, those students that don't have any other options for a legal education, particularly those consumers the state bar is charged to protect. Imagine if your mortgage company decided to increase your mortgage payment by 955%. You'd lose your home. In the same sense, for those smaller schools that will not be able to absorb these excessive fees, it will spell the end 
for them and their ability to provide a affordable quality legal education for those who can least afford it. I understand this latest fee proposal that I think will be a, is on the agenda for this afternoon. Um, that increase is being represented as an average of $224 per student. At face value, that may not sound unreasonable, but that amount is misleading and offers a false sense of equity. The direct cost to smaller schools such as Cal Northern is over twice that much and three times the current costs. This increase will undoubtedly have to be passed on to our students and will set back the important progress Cal's have made towards equity, diversion, and inclusion in the legal profession, which is not only a state bar mandate, but something I know is important to us all. Put yourselves into my shoes. What's going to happen when I have to tell my first generation African-American female student that her JD is going to cost her an additional $2,000 and she says, I can't afford a penny more. Better yet, put yourselves in her shoes. In closing, we ask that you reconsider these fee increases and what the implementation of these fee increases will mean to the legal profession and find alternative ways to address whatever economic shortfalls the state bar may be experiencing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for those, you and your colleagues, I'll just tell you this, this issue is really up at the Board of Trustees at this point. Um, I don't think they're, they're not asking us for an additional recommendation as to the amount of your fees. So um, you would be well advised to focus your efforts in speaking to them. So we're talking about um, the cost reduction item. Uh, actually, we're not talking, we're not discussing it this afternoon. I think we're just going to receive some information tee it up to me. prepare, tee it up as you will for um, our discussion at our next meeting um, next Wednesday. Any other comments? Anyone in the audience? No one else online? No. No. Okay. Uh, then I will close. Thank you all for your comments and close the couple public comment period. And we will go to our next item, which I believe is, yes, the chair's report. Um, we're gonna do it all in. Yeah. No, 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 we're gonna do it in. at the end when they close yeah. open. Because we sit down. Exactly. Okay. Um, just a couple things to report. Um, uh, I'll I'll make some comments related to specific items later, uh, uh, but uh, I th we have two members who have resigned or have resigned from the committee recently, um, Dr. Wilcoxon most recently, and Judge Guerra um, uh, before that. So we're a little bit down in our head count. Um, uh, I guess um, maybe the next time we can bring back um, certificates for them mm -hmm. for us to adopt and formally recognize their service and thank them. Um, and basically, that's that's all I have to report there. And then you have to go back to the minutes. Oh, and I, of course, glossed over the minutes of <laughs> our open meeting um, of April 21st. So do we have any? Um, uh, Ashley, did you have some corrections? There's a slight edit. The, Can you use the mic? Oh, um, slight edit. The date's wrong on the first page. <clears throat> and do you want to describe it or have you? Um, the date says April 26th and the meeting was held on. Oh, okay. Thanks. Any other corrections to the minutes? Anyone? Okay. Um, can I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Torres second by Brody. Torres, second Brody. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Alex Chan? Yes. Jim Epstein? I'm going to abstain. I wasn't there. Kareem Gangora? Dolores Heisinger? Larry Kaplan? Yes. Alex <laughs> Lawrence? Yes. Esther Lynn? Bethany Peak? Ashley Silva Guzman? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Paul Kramer? Yes. With 10 yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. Thank you. Um, let's move on. Uh, there's a note in the agenda. We are um, 
as several of you have requested, we're actually going to have a real non-working lunch today from about noon to uh, 1245. So uh, we had to put it somewhere in here and that's where it best fit. Um, but we'll see how much we get done before that. We're not, we're not going to hold the other items off until after lunch. Um, next item is approval of the draft report to the Supreme Court on the February 2023 uh, California bar exam. Uh, Christina and Mr. Lawrence. I'm going to ask that door by summary of oh, you, For the Zoom folks uh, and the recording, we need to make sure we're all speaking into a microphone. And Amy, maybe pass yours over to them. Let me hand this over to Christina. Oh. You know? This is a copy of the annual report that uh, the Committee of Bar Examiners approves the draft before it is sent to the Supreme Court. This specifically is for the February 2023 bar exam. It includes um, our general statistics, which we also post online on the website, an analysis of the February 2023 general bar exam and the essay questions performance test and the selected answers uh, accompanied with that exam. Any questions, anyone or comments? Can we put up the motion? We're doing that. Okay. Christian, is there a motion? Yes. All right. I will put it up. Oh, no, Christina's got it. Okay. Does anyone wish to make this motion or a substitute of their own making? the draft report that I've written here. This is Brody. Okay, moved by Brody. Laura second. Laura second. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Alex Chan? Jim Efting? Yes. Kareem Gangora? Dolores Heisinger? Larry Kaplan? Yes. Alex Lawrence? Yes. Esther Lynn? Bethany Peak? Ashley Silva Guzman? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Paul Kramer? Yes. With 11 yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. Thank you. Um, next is operations and management. Uh, first item is action on revision to the special admissions rules. Uh, recommendation to the Board of Trustees to circulate for public comment amendments to the state bar rules and the rules of court relating to the registered in-house counsel program, regist registered legal aid attorneys program, registered military spouse attorneys program, and the foreign legal consultants uh, rule uh, and out of state attorney arbitration council programs. Um, Amy, you're going to take the lead on this one? Yes, I am. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're bringing these. Um, this is your set mic on? Proposed, is it on? Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Okay. So we're bringing this set of proposed changes back to uh, the committee today. Uh, addressing concerns that were raised at the April 2023 CBE meeting. I want to remind everybody what, uh, next slide please, uh, what we intended to address with the rules revision uh, and they include what you see here, uh, addressing any contradictions between the rule of court, statute and state bar rules, clarifying any ambiguity raised by staff or by applicants, to revisit the rule with an eye towards access and fairness, uh, such as looking at whether un any unnecessary hurdles exist in the rules. Uh, does the uh, current rule further public protection and consumer protection? And so in preparation for uh, the rules proposals, 
uh, we met with uh, key stakeholders to gather feedback about how the programs operated since the last set of rule changes in 2019. This is a list of the stakeholders, sorry, next screen, that were consulted um, as part of this initiative. And just to remind the committee um, and uh, anybody who's watching this, that um, about the programs and uh, the parameters of each of the programs. Uh, so the programs that we are uh, proposing uh, rule changes to are, are three uh, MJP programs that include registered in-house counsel, registered military spouse attorneys, registered legal aid attorneys, and also our foreign legal consultants. Uh, this, these are the parameters of each of those programs. As you can see here, um, the, two of the programs require uh, supervision. Uh, in terms of program requirements, registered in-house counsel must work for a qualifying institution. Registered military spouse attorneys uh, can work at, uh, for various employers. Registered legal aid attorneys must work for an eligible legal aid organization. Uh, the registered in-house counsel must reside in California, as well as uh, military spouse attorneys um, and legal aid attorneys do not have to live in California. Uh, so with that, I'm going to jump into uh, each of the uh, areas. One thing that uh, was asked and raised at the last meeting, too, was how many um, applicants are we talking about on an annual basis, or what do, um, how many uh, current uh, active practicing MJPs and FLCs exist um, in California? And these are statistics from the end of April. We, had a nine, we have 1,981 registered in-house counsel that are working in California. We have, uh, we have 41 registered legal aid attorneys and nine uh, registered military spouse attorneys. So again, one of the benefits of this rules revision is to look at any, uh, eliminate any unnecessary hurdles. And that was our attempt with these proposed changes. Next slide, please. Uh, so some of these are procedural uh, changes. So here, uh, the current rules refer to filing a separate application for the MJP's employer. So the business entity, legal aid organization, or military spouse attorney supervisor, in addition to the attorney's application. The proposed change is to add, uh, to require a declaration for the employer to attest its qualifications and that uh, we do this at the initial stage of the application as well as annually after that. Uh, the idea here is it'll enhance public protection by providing an annual and more frequent review of the employer's status and it eliminates the need to uh, have uh, the employer's application. The next change is addressing termination for not, cause, uh, for not addressing a cause for suspension. So at present for both MJPs and FLCs, they can be suspended for a variety of infractions, uh, such as failing to register to, or pay annual dues or failure to comply with standards of professional conduct. Uh, they, um, there is no method at the moment for determining what an applicant's intention is at the suspension stage. That is whether they plan to return to the function as MJP or FLC, or whether they plan to uh, simply terminate so the proposed rule change requires that they take corrective action to resolve this matter uh, within six months. And if they fail to do that, it would lead to termination of the program. Again, applicants in suspended status right now are not permitted to practice. And so terminating applicants who do not address the, their suspension matter uh, would provide assurance that the applicant has not continued to work while on suspended status, uh, which furthers uh, uh, protects uh, the public. So here, uh, the change is uh, to uh, add this as a cause for termination. Uh, and one thing to remember is that uh, MJP applicants can be reinstated after being terminated, uh, and they would do so by submitting a new application. And if their moral character application has expired, a new moral character application would be required as well. The next item is a clarification on the requirement to be eligible to practice law. So um, the law uh, was modified in 2019 that noted you had to be eligible, you had to be uh, in good standing in at least one jurisdiction. 
uh, we need some clarification about uh, being in good standing and uh, eligible to practice in uh, law in that jurisdiction. And that is what this uh, proposed uh, change attempts to do. Also, a clarification on when an applicant can start practicing. Because MJP applicants are required to submit a moral character application, there's been a, a little confusion of when an applicant can actually start practicing. So this rule change proposes to clarify that an MJP applicant can start practicing once their application has been approved, and they may practice while awaiting their moral character application. And that's the case for multi-jurisdictional uh, practice attorneys. FLC can start practicing once application and moral character uh, application have been approved. All right, uh, the next, please. This is about a failure to uh, report employment termination. This is a challenging area for staff. So while uh, the registered in-house counsel, military spouse attorneys and RLAAs are all required to report to the state bar within 30 days that they've been terminated from employment uh, from their uh, qualifying institution or employer, it doesn't always happen. In fact, uh, state bar staff sometimes learns of their termination only because MJP is um, submitting a new qualifying institution or supervising supervisor declaration. So the rule proposes to provide a mechanism for sanctioning MJPs who fail to report within 30 days. Also, the rules require that the MJP maintain an address of record with the state bar, which must be the current California office address of the attorney's employer and a current email address. So this rule will um, ensure greater compliance with uh, the state bar having notification about employer changes. The next rule change is about eliminating voluntary transfer to inactive status as a ground for suspension. So given that uh, MJP applicants have to remain active in active status in at least one jurisdiction that their license is, this is a rule uh, just making a technical correction to remove that if you are inactive in, uh, in one of the jurisdictions, uh, that, that is not a ground for suspension. All right, the next slide is uh, related just to registered legal aid attorneys and registered military spouse attorneys. So here, the rule change is about uh, the fact that uh, the current rules require that registered legal aid attorneys and registered military spouse attorneys cannot have taken and failed the California bar exam in the preceding five years before applying. It, uh, this rule does not apply to registered in-house counsel and staff has received significant feedback about the negative effect that this has on participation. And uh, we looked at the origins of this requirement and uh, what we've discovered is that this uh, rule um, initiated with that the intention of the program was to open this program to out-of-state attorneys who have not demonstrated that they possess minimum competence required to practice law, but um, on a temporary basis and under the supervision of a California attorney. Uh, this may no longer be uh, a uh, registered legal aid attorney or registered military spouse attorney's intent. Uh, so for registered legal aid attorneys, some applicants may wish to continue in the capacity of a registered legal aid attorney uh, as a long-term career. So uh, the working group evaluated the purpose of this limitation and concluded that the requirement may no longer be relevant or necessary and may actually be creating a barrier to participation in this important program and may not be necessary for public protection. So for that reason, uh, the proposal is to eliminate the registered legal aid attorney uh, cap on, um, sorry, uh, the, uh, the exam um, uh, requirement. That is that uh, applicants uh, removing the requirement that they cannot have taken the exam five years prior and, um, and it will incentivize also uh, those to take the bar exam. As for the supervision requirement, this was an area that uh, we've received uh, concerns from the CBE at the last April meeting. So uh, what we've heard from stakeholders is that the, um, the supervising requirement for registered legal aid attorneys and registered military spouse attorneys is very onerous. Uh, that is, 
the rule states that the supervising an attorney must approve in writing any court appearance, um, uh, whether it's a deposition, arbitration, or other proceedings. And the supervising attorney must also read, approve, and personally sign any pleadings, uh, briefs, or other similar documents that are prepared by uh, registered legal aid attorneys or military spouse attorneys. So the supervision uh, rule was clearly intended to protect the, the public from non-California licensed attorneys who may not have the requisite skills um, in certain instances to practice law without supervision. So this, again, when we brought it to the committee, our original uh, proposal was to eliminate this rule. Uh, there were concerns about whether that was sufficient um, protection for the public. And so um, in our discussions, uh, what we concluded is, um, or uh, came to understand is the concern was also about attorneys who may not have sufficient uh, uh, law practice experience. As a result, the, we've revised the recommendation, and the recommendation is to require those that level of supervision for attorneys who have practiced less than five years or three of the last five years um, in, in uh, home jurisdiction. And this is practicing law um, in their home jurisdiction. And so, um, again, this is relaxing the, the level of supervision requirements for those that are coming in with more uh, uh, legal practice of law experience into California. Um, and then in terms of limiting participation um, to five years, so California law allows longer um, participation as an RLA uh, than many other states. So uh, the working group discussed whether the limitation of five years was necessary for protecting the public and, uh, the, and concluded that they recommend that the five-year limit participation should be eliminated on the basis that allowing them uh, to continue beyond five years would provide more legal services in California. So um, the, they recognize that the elimination may be interpreted uh, as a form of a permanent alternative licensure, um, but con we concluded that the benefits are vast and would not threaten public protection given the safeguards that exist in the rule of the supervision requirement. Uh, the fact that they also have to remain in good standing in their home jurisdiction, and uh, they have a moral character clearance, and once they register with us, they would also, we continue monitoring uh, their uh, uh, work here in California. So the proposal here is to eliminate the um, five-year rule. And for military spouse attorney, the idea is to not limit their participation to a maximum of five years as it is now, but to allow the term to continue as long as the spouse is still stationed in California beyond five years, if, if that is the case. Uh, again, the working group do not believe that this limitation um, the limitation right now furthers uh, public protection, but it, that it may be disruptive to the provision of legal services in California. So the proposal, again, is to eliminate the five-year rule for both the registered legal aid attorney and registered military spouse attorneys. Uh, the next uh, slide, please, is about um, registered in-house counsel, and this is removing the residency requirement. So. Um, and we brought this uh, last at the last meeting. Some other states um, do not require, uh, there's a varying practice in whether other states require in-state in residency. Uh, for example, New York allows a registered in-house counsel to serve from out of state, while other jurisdictions such as Colorado require in-state residency, as does California right now. So in our discussions with the working group, uh, we discussed the fact that geographic boundaries do not have the same significance as they did when uh, these programs started. Uh, we are now in an era of a more telecommuting, teleconferencing, video hearings, electronic court filings on a national level. So the working group believes that removing the residency requirement would not pose a threat to public protection. And that is what's being recommended here is to eliminate that requirement. All right, um, so the next changes are related to um, 
the military spouse attorney um, it just uh, specifically. So one of the potential challenges um, that, or one of the challenges that has been reported by a registered military spouse attorney is the fact that a declaration signed by the supervising attorney attesting that they'll supervise the applicant and assume responsibility for their work is required very early in the application process. Uh, that uh, the signed declaration uh, is part of that uh, application, and which means that a registered military spouse attorney must identify an employer before applying and be even, a, even a, approved for the program. And so the way that this uh, rule change is addressing that challenge is to require the um, application process to break it down into two steps. In step one, the applicant would establish that they're eligible to participate in the program by ensuring that they meet all of the requirements. Once that application is reviewed, we can establish a conditional approval um, that they can use to uh, seek an attorney, making it clear that uh, the out once we get a, an attorney declaration, that applicant could um, start uh, working. And so again, the second step would be initiated once an employer is found, the applicant could then submit that uh, supervising attorney de declaration, and um, we would provide uh, some form of cert certificate that would allow them to participate. Um, uh, the change does not alter the requirements, but just eliminates a, a potential significant hurdle that exists at the moment in that rule um, that's limiting the number of um, uh, registered military spouse ability to participate. And uh, we go to the last screen. So the motion uh, is to uh, for the committee to recommend that the Board of T Trustees circulate these proposed rules uh, that are set forth in attachments A through Q for a 60-day public comment period. And so with that, I'll open it up um, to see if anybody has any questions or concerns. Does anybody have questions? I just want to comment that uh, these are excellent uh, issues and recommendations. I can tell you that you did very good work on this, and I'll I'll move uh, I'll move on the proposed motion. I'll second. Okay. Um, and don't take the role yet. Um, so that's. Um, Rosenberg's rules of order actually prefer that we do this and then have a discussion, put a motion on the table. Um, if nobody else has any questions, I have one. Uh, Donna has a few as well. Why don't you go first, Donna? Can you get your mic there right in front of you? Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, uh, specifically looking at, the, looking at the rules on the registered military spouse attorney, um, and I am looking at the state bar rules, not the rule of court. Um, I think maybe the placement, that my mouse is not moving here. Would it help for you to maybe to share your screen and then you could highlight, move your cursor around and show us what you're oh, talking about? I'm not on Zoom. Okay. Um, so you describe in rule 3.351, um, and this is, you describe this as the process where the um, where prior to employment, the uh, you submit the declaration from the supervisor to eliminate the challenge that some of those military spouses may experience. Is it possible that we put the prior to commencing of employment in the wrong place? It looks, it it as written, it reads that it's prior to commencing an em employment, you submit the declaration signed by the registered legal aid attorney. That's not attached to the line that says uh, in five, submit a declaration signed by the supervising attorney. So it feels like that's just in the wrong place. I can definitely correct that. Um, I did also want to, I just want to make sure that we talk a little bit about the um, supervision requirements um, because the, um, the supervision requirements in both the registered legal aid attorney rules and the registered military spouse attorney rules divide up the requirements into two different pieces. One piece that um, the, it, under the existing rules, um, one level of supervision that has to be exercised to the extent required for the protection of the client and the and the um, the client or the or the customer, and then the other sort of more intensive you have to personally sign um, documentation um, that doesn't have that limitation. 
And so I, I do think it's worth a discussion of the committee um, about whether or not the, the less stringent requirements that are to the extent required, right? The supervision is only to the extent required for the protection of the customer or the client. Do we want to lift those um, as is currently proposed? Um, or because it has that caveat there, giving the supervisor the ability to make a determination, is that kind of enough for, for that particular limitation? Um, and then the more strenuous ones, um, where we've said, if you, are, if you have less than five years um, of practice or three of the past five, I also want to um, make sure that we are clear, is that any combination of legal practice prior to your becoming a registered legal aid attorney or a registered military spouse or subsequent? Um, because I ask that because you can have somebody who's been registered legal aid attorney for six years who arguably has a lot more California experience than somebody who has been practicing in another state for 16 years, um, it would seem that the point of the supervision requirement was at least in part because they don't have California law experience. So I just wanna make sure that we're covering um, that California, it, um, that, that, that if you built up that California experience then that can um, <coughs> equal the amount of time needed to surpass the supervision requirement. Um. I see some puzzled faces because they're trying to imagine what they read a day or two ago. Um, Devin, can you send me a link so I'm a panelist rather than, I got in on the public link and I can't share anything. Oh, I can promote you. Okay, or you, you can promote me. I think you'll see me there. Um, yeah, so we can see the words. And I need that for the question I have as well. Would you prefer the clean version or the marked up version to be projected? I have both. Did you find me? Yes, I um, sent you the link. Oh, yeah, because I don't see you. Uh, I don't see you as the same. A, a attendee, so I sent you a panelist link. Maybe I got it. Email. Oh, yes, oh you I'll sent me a link. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's okay. Out. I should leave this one first, right? Yeah. Go to the link here. Email. Okay. There we go. this one. Yeah, got it. Okay, so what was the section again, Donna? Uh, do you want to talk about the supervision one or the, uh, or the, uh... well, I guess supervision was your first point, right? Three five one. Three five one. Three five one eight five. Yeah, so the first one was three point three three five one. Right. Uh, 
A4. A4. And it goes, yeah, we, we scroll a little bit, so four is a little higher on the screen. No, the other way. Yeah. So, um, so by point with A4 is that uh, prior to commencement of employment language was added, I think we meant to add it in five instead of one. Um, so I think that's um, that's just a technical suggestion um, because that would make clear that the supervising attorney record does not need to be um, submitted at the front end of the process, um, but um, but at the at the back. End. So that they can get pre-approved uh, pre as a as a registered military spouse attorney and then secure the employment. So they can take their pre-approval to a potential employer and, and perhaps that'll work out better for them. That was certainly the intent, Amy, right? Yes, correct. Right. So are you suggesting a way to change this to make that even more clear, Donna? Yes. Yeah, I think if you just move the prior to commencement of employment from four to five, I think I think it's just a I think it's just a textbook. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it might be good to have something uh, in the beginning of four, though, to indicate the ability to get pre-approved, right? To telegraph that thought. I don't know if that's clear enough. I would scroll, but people will get dizzy watching me do that, so I'm going to be careful. on that process, but that we wanted to make sure that the rules allowed the rule didn't require the submission of the supervisory attorney declaration in order to initiate. Should we scroll down just a little bit so we can take a look at three, how it relates to this way? A uh, uh, yes. down the opposite. More? No, no, no. Uh, he, Sorry. Go I on. think he means up. up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> up. up is down. Far enough. Good. Um, yeah, I understand. I, I think Donna has a fair point there. Yes, I can make that correction. Do you, do you have, do you want to do by show a word document with the corrections or how should we try to what might be the most clear? Before? Sure. I can. In this case, it's pretty simple, though. It is. Just mm -hmm. move, yeah. move the red phrase to the to the next paragraph. Okay. Because these are PDF versions, so it's harder to edit on the fly. Yeah. And so then the next uh, is the rule of court. Uh, rule, of rule of court. Okay. Hold on a second. For military spouses? Uh, yeah, you can use, you can pull up that one. Sorry? That, that one. Where is that one? That's 9.41.1. Yeah. Um, was that in the attachments, Amy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. it is. Attachment mm -hmm. okay. A was in-house counsel. It, it, it's either either use attachment K or attachment. Um, oh, I left K out. Okay, hold on. Uh, you can use attachment G, 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 G or K. Well. The rule applies for both. Versions. That's legal aid, though. Yeah, it applies to both. Okay. And. There we go. Whereabouts? Okay. Um, Chair, any way you can zoom in as much as oh, yeah, I love sorry. my 2020, it's pretty hard to read. And, and we're looking at um, section H. Oh. Too big. There That's we good. go. That's great. There we go. Yeah. Section 
Thank you. So what I'm pointing, what I was uh, pointing out um, was the language which had originally said, uh, had started with assist counsel and provide direct supervision, what's now in, in five. Um, the, you'll see the, the clause that, that still exists, approve in writing and the appearance in court, deposition, et cetera. All of that is modified by to the extent required for the protection of the client or customer. And so the question that I thought the committee should discuss was um, being that there's that tail on that on that piece. Um, should you uh, um, should you be eliminating that supervision um, for those with more than five years in practice or who have not who have practiced more than three of the five five years? This is sort of the, if you would, sort of the you know, lesser level of, of supervision. Um, though you could, um, again, because it's got that tail of to the extent required for the protection of the client or the customer, it seems like we would always want that, right? You'd always want to supervise to that level if necessary for the protection of the client or customer, leave it to the supervisor to make that decision. Or to put it another way, we're, we're saying that if they don't have the requisite experience, protection of the client requires that they be supervised. So we don't need that other modifier. Probably should be deleted because we've defined, um, didn't there, Amy, didn't there used to be a California aspect to this though? It seems to be missing here. Um, that we're looking for California experience. I mean, it had to be, um, wasn't it legal practice in California we were looking for? Because uh, the I think Alex Chan's point was familiarity with California law was an important aspect of uh, being able to go unsupervised, right? No, I think his concern was attorneys that had minimal to no experience in their home jurisdiction coming to practice in California, right? Correct. So, so this is okay the way it is, Alex? Because we're not going to have that many people that have California experience coming in from out of state to serve. You have to project a little bit more. Because we're yeah, we're not going to have that many attorneys with California experience coming in to serve as registered legal aid attorneys or military spouse attorney. I think this addressed Alex's concern, which was attorneys who may have recently become licensed in their home jurisdiction wanting to come and practice here. And I think Alex has, uh, agrees that that's what this was a trying to address. Correct. Okay, so you weren't worried about California specific experience? No. no. Okay, then this, this seems point, to do that. But Donna's point is, uh, what about scenarios where somebody's been working as a registered legal aid attorney and has California experience? The language that's reflected in here does not recognize that because I don't think we've uh, identified what we mean by legal practice. Right, Donna? Right. We talk about practicing law within... Um, you know, five years of legal practice and practice law, as opposed to just saying that they were an active attorney yes. in that home jurisdiction. Um, uh, it, it, so I, so I, I think potentially what you want to do is clarify that that's legal practice uh, in their home jurisdiction, or as a in this instance in this rule registered legal aid attorney in Rule Nine Point Four One Point One as a registered military spouse attorney. Where they would have gained the California experience over that that basis. So could we do that by um, in this uh, adding uh, less than five years experience of, of legal practice in a jurisdiction or um, in California? Or and then that adds two ors um, or who have not practiced law within the last thirty five years in a jurisdiction. I mean, um, so adding the component of California experience after the legal practice in a jurisdiction. I, I think it would be helpful for the committee to sort of agree conceptually and then we could work a bit um, after, depending on what the committee adopts. But if the, we can decide what the committee conceptually wants to go with and then um, we can work with it later. Well, um, perhaps Alex, you can um, answer that. Would you feel comfortable with that, given that you raised this concern initially? Yeah, I'm still trying to wrap my head around um, what we're trying to achieve. Are we trying to contemplate the possibility of including those who have practiced, I think in your example, 16 years in a different jurisdiction? No, I think it's people who, um, Donna's raising people who, 
perhaps right now are um, serving as registered legal aid attorneys that with enough experience here, that um, supervision requirement would be lifted. Right, but here the language says with less than five. So this paragraph says attorneys supervising registered legal aid attorneys with less than five years of legal practice. So you have more than five years of legal practice. This provision wouldn't apply, right? Correct. But I think the issue is if you have somebody who's practiced, let's say, two years in their home jurisdiction, they've come to California to serve as registered legal or um, they don't really have to come to California, but they've started serving as registered legal aid attorney in California, and they've been doing it for more than five years or almost at five years because they have there's a current cap on participation. So let's say they're in their fifth year, this requirement would still require them to participate because it doesn't make a distinction between practice in their home jurisdiction and practice as an RLA in California. Well, I thought we said a couple of minutes ago, we didn't, we didn't care whether their experience was in California or elsewhere. Yeah. Right, and that's why we have in a jurisdiction, which right. is not state specific. Okay. I think it, it hinges on the question of what do you mean by legal practice? And that is something that we should probably think about sort of being clear what we mean. Um, um, you know, um, are we talking about somebody who is actively licensed as a lawyer? Are we talking about, um, you know, what is it that constitutes that five years of legal practice in a jurisdiction outside of California or legal practice as a registered legal aid attorney or registered relative elsewhere? If that's what we're, if we're envisioning both, um, then then that's fine. It's just the definition of legal practice. I think I think could there could be a, a clearer um, identification of what we mean by legal practice. One way that we could resolve that is potentially um, adding it in the definition section. So if in, under A, a definition for what we mean by um, legal practice there, defining it there. Five years of licensure, five years of legal practice, licensed attorney. That's what we're asking. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, can you scroll up to um, A under the definitions? So could we add a definition for uh, legal practice in a jurisdiction here and note that we also include um, that working in California is, is part of that legal practice, can be considered part of that legal practice? But by definition, they're, if they need this, they're not allowed to practice law in California. So you're you're meaning to catch the somebody working as a registered in-house counsel, um, that kind of experience that's under one of the other uh, these programs that allows non-California barred attorneys to practice law in California. Yes. Is that sounds like an edge case? Is it even worth addressing? No, I think the the idea was to make sure that your experience as one of these licensees, as a registered legal aid attorney, a registered military spouse attorney, would count to the same extent that your your legal experience as a licensed attorney in Arizona would count. Oh, okay, yeah. Simple definition: legal practice includes practicing under. And maybe we list the programs um, in California. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anyone have any concerns about that? No, that's fine. Yeah, no, no concerns. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, people willing to authorize staff to, to get that exactly right after we send them on. Okay. Did you have something else, Donna? Okay. Sorry, no, I raised the issues that I. That My I one question was about um, Amy. It's 
Let me pull it up here. Um, it's the registered in-house counsel court rule. I think I need to open again. Uh, let's see. So when we talk about the scope of practice that's allowed to registered in-house counsel, um, in the existing rules, there's a, it took me several times reading this and knowing what it was meaning to say to understand it, but it, it says that somebody who's a registered in-house counsel cannot also make um, pro hoc vice appearances in California courts on behalf of their employer. And that, I guess, was a bargain that was struck um, in the past. Um, and probably really didn't affect many people because if they were coming from out of state, which is a requirement of the Pro Hoc Vice rules, um, then they weren't living in, they couldn't be living in California. And we required registered uh, until these changes were proposing, we required that registered in-house councils be resident in California. But now with the elimination of the residency requirement, we, we create the possibility that um, they could, um, somebody could be say in Ohio working for a multinational corporation or, and registering as in-house counsel in California to do some California work but may also want to come uh, and defend the corporation in California in a California court case. Um, we're continuing to leave the prohibition in. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm just noting that. Um, there, right here, Amy, there's a period after above. Um, That should be a comma, I think. Minor change. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a typo. It. Um, but the other thing we talked about in the working group was up here. Um, we're allowing, and this is kind of a convenience to make things easier for and encourage registered in house councils to also, if they're willing, to provide um, uh, legal services. Um, but um, I thought, Amy, we were talking about recommending removing the portion I've highlighted here and uh, allow registered in-house counsels only to provide pro bono legal services through an eligible legal aid organization. Um, is that your recollection? And, and not through the organization itself. Mm -hmm. So for instance, some big corporation could somehow be do, you know, hang out a pro bono shingle and be doing legal aid clinics or something, because um, first of all, you told me you didn't think you, you had no inkling that anybody was doing that presently, but also it seemed like it would be a regulatory problem for us to be able to police that. So the proposal is to re remove the language that's highlighted here. As, is that your recollection? Um, yes, now that you're okay. raising this, because I know we went back and forth on this issue. So you're right, um, Paul. Um, not only do we have, um, we don't have any applicants in that, um, in this um, uh, category that is serving as both registers, registered in house counsel and registered legal aid um, to do pro bono work or doing pro bono work within their eligible organization. So I think, uh, and you're right, the oversight would be challenging. So I think eliminating that makes sense. And I could add that as well. Okay. So um, does anybody, um, have any concerns about deleting the highlighted language there? Um, Only one. From time to time, and I'm not necessarily certain what type of uh, law firms we're talking about. I think you said corporations, but if there was a law firm that brought in in house, I know that uh, there are firms that handle pro bono death penalty issues on appeal or by habeas corpus, things of that nature. Are we eliminating these individuals? Well, if they're California lawyers, of course they could do it. Right. You know, if they were members of our bar. Um, 
I mean, that would be seem to me that's similar to the pro hoc vice um, prohibition. You know, the balance struck before our time. Right. Like if you're a registered in-house counsel, you 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 can't come in um, by the by that back door to mm -hmm. all of a sudden be representing your client in court in California. Yeah. Um, get local counsel or um, become a member of our bar. Kind mm -hmm. of the message. What I'm worried about is this, uh, and you know, innovation being what it is these days. Somebody creating, in effect, a law firm um, that's it's a corporate shell that basically just does legal services in California, and its lawyers, you know, are registered in-house counsel, um, uh, but they're they're doing these things, you know, kind of the the, the shell corporation is the the mechanism for them to avoid becoming full members of our bar. And I, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine if I, if I could imagine exactly how that would go, I would probably be writing scripts for Hollywood, but you know, somebody's going to figure it out at some point. And, yeah. and I don't think we want that kind of mess to have to clean up. The opens of a Pandora box. We don't want to... Would you invest in that startup, Alex? I'm sorry. Would you invest in that startup? Of course not. <laughs> okay. Um, does that, does that sort of answer your question, David? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. So, do we have any other questions or comments about this uh, rule package? It's a it is a complicated one because we're amending three or four rules of court, which means um, they'll have to consider that along with our um, uh, you know our own rules. Um, but it's the idea was to to clean things up and. Um, you know, for instance, in the case of reducing the separate application for the employer, make things uh, simpler um, uh, for uh, because maybe that will allow more people to participate in these programs. So the motion was made. I've forgotten by whom. Did you get that down, Devin? Um, yes, the motion okay. was made by David Torres and seconded by Kareem. Okay, so if there's no further comment, let's take the roll. Dr. Bolton. Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Alex Chan? Yes. Jim Efting? Yes. Kareem Gangora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Larry Kaplan? Yes. Alex Lawrence? Yes. Esther Lynn? <laughs> Bethany Peak? Ashley Silva Guzman? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Paul Kramer? Yes. With 12 yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. Okay. Um, next is the discussion and action on the refund of fees policy for examinations, which also includes the um, rejected payments policy. And Am I going to take the lead on that yeah, one? And you're good with that mic, Tammy. Yes, okay. you guys can hear me okay? Good morning, everyone. So as many of you will recall, the last meeting that we had in April, we brought the refund of fees policy to the committee to review uh, various aspects of our refund policy and make some determinations, get some feedback, and be able to try to update our refund of fees policy. We also brought a rejected payment policy idea to the committee last time. So um, after we had discussion at the last meeting, we did have a lot of changes um, that we made to the language. Uh, we discussed some of the various uh, topics within the refund of fees policy and were able to get some of those in a place where everybody was in agreement. Um, but we did need to bring some more things back to the committee for further discussion. So this time around, we thought it would be good for us to just have the discussion about these items, uh, see if we can come to a consensus with everybody's opinion on those uh, different items. And then at that point, once we have that information, I will update the policy and I will bring it back in August with the full final policy for everybody to look at at that time and finalize and, and put to motion. So next slide, please. 
And of course, this uh, was something that we worked on. I worked on with my working group, which was David Torres and Jim Epton, who are both here today. So if they have any comments or feedback, they'll be able to uh, provide that as well as we go through this. So just to kind of recap on what we talked about in the last meeting, uh, when we were reviewing the refund of fees policy, we did look at things such as statute, the admission rules, as well as various committee of bar examiner policies with regards to the administration of the examinations. The following areas that we reviewed for the refund policy and uh, examinations was exam application dates and deadlines, examination attendance policies, withdrawals of exam applications. Um, there's the refund of fees policy, which covers the 95% death and medical refunds. And uh, we also discussed a new rejected payments policy. Next slide. So some of the items that the working group had reviewed and basically recommended that we did not need to make reservation, uh, uh, sorry, revisions, was based on really things that were in the statute that we felt still were appropriate for what we are doing at this point in time. And that was the availability of the applications and the related deadlines with that. Uh, no, there's no statute that specifies specific deadlines for the first year, but that we apply the same uh, methodology and standards to that as we do the California bar exam. And also uh, looking at the, atten the attendance of our applicants that you know, it is required for the applicants to sit for all sessions, uh, and they also have to make sure that they are in their seat no later than one hour after the exam has started. And these were all areas that we felt that were still appropriate and didn't really require any uh, changes. Uh, one of the areas that we didn't really get to go into a lot of discussion last time was with regards to the policy about a flat fee penalty fee for no-shows. This is something that was brought to the committee in uh, June of 2017. At that time, it was a discussion, but there was never any motion put forth on any changes. Uh, so at this point, we wanted to bring it back up, let the committee be aware of what this was in 2017, and basically see, is this something that the committee wants to pursue? Um, if applicants are no-shows at this point, uh, they do not get a refund of their exam fees. It is a loss for them at that point. So if we were to uh, apply a flat fee, no-show penalty fee, that would be in addition to the exam fees that they've already paid and are not going to be able to get a refund on, other than if they, of course, apply for the 95% refund due to a uh, death or a medical reason. So this is something we wanted to open up for discussion and see if the committee has any strong opinions on this, uh, do we decide not to apply that no-show flat fee penalty? Um, where would they like to see this go? Um, and I'm gonna open this up now so we can have this discussion because then when we move on, we're not gonna have to go back. So I'm gonna ask that everybody is able to discuss at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this, this is Robbie, I wanna make sure that I'm clear, this would, the idea is a penalty on top of losing your entire uh, application fee to sit for the bar? That is correct. I feel like that's sufficient. Okay. I don't, I yeah, don't what's, know. what is what David the extra cost? Vince thinks, but I feel like, because isn't that, it, it's almost a thousand dollars. Yeah, it depends on what applicant type you are, if you're an attorney versus a general applicant. But yes, it's upwards of $1,000. So it seems like that is a, if you don't show up at the bar exam, you forfeited your, your fee. Uh, and I don't know, do you already get kickback on that? Kickback in what way? I mean, we we don't give them the money back because... Do applicants seek a return of their application fee when they don't attend? They do if they're requesting a 95% refund under the death and medical aspects. But other than that, I mean, somebody might request it, but they're not going to get that refund because it was not allowed to be processed. I mean, I guess just without knowing any more, having not been on your subcommittee on this, I think that's sufficient to forfeit your you know, 
I mean, I, I, we kept in mind the fact that, and a lot of people are not aware of this, but once a person has the intention of, of taking the bar exam, we pretty, pretty much believe that that person has studied or is in the process of studying for the bar exam. But once the, those funds come to the uh, state bar, it's a lot of wills that start moving. And we're talking about contracting with major hotels throughout the state of California. We're talking about uh, contracting with proctors. There's so, there are so many logistics that are tied into this as well as, well as uh, man and woman talent in terms of putting this uh, examination together. So a lot of people are not aware of this, but this is the reason why we believe that this particular proposal is reasonable under the circumstances. So what are the extra costs that we incur versus somebody who sits for the exam and gets graded? Um, we don't have to grade an exam that wasn't taken. It's just hard. I'm having a trouble trouble seeing why it costs would cost us more, and therefore we would want to recover that from them. I think the idea was there was a burden to the bar to the staff because someone didn't show up when they were supposed to be there. Where are they? What's going on with them? How, how do we deal with this? Um, and we just felt that, that if you didn't respect staff enough to show up or explain why you're, you show up, a penalty was appropriate. Sorry for being harsh, but that's how we felt. Question, Tammy, have we conducted an internal analysis to find out exactly how much money it costs at the moment when an applicant submits um, you know, the fees to the point of sitting at the bar versus the money that we spend for grading and, and issuing results? Have, have we conducted kind of analysis? So a little later in the presentation here, I do have a uh, pie chart to show what the percentage of costs are that we put into the exam in different components. Um, but everything leading up to the exam, we have already started contracting or already contracted. Uh, we are hiring, you know, all of our vendors to do all the electrical, the table rental, and all of these vendors, they're not all willing to wait until after the bar exam to get paid. So we are paying our vendors. A lot of the times it's going to be up front before the exam that we've already paid for these tables and, and all of those different facets. So everything leading up to the bar exam to make sure that exam is ready to hit the ground running on that first day is pretty much taken care of by the time we get there. The only fees such as what Paul just mentioned is that we're not gonna pay for grading if somebody doesn't take the exam and we are not gonna be paying for the scoring of their MBE because they didn't take the MBE. Mm -hmm. But after that, there's nothing else really after the exam is over that would be considered something that is not being covered because they didn't take the exam. Yeah, for the life of me, I've never understood why we have, you know, different percentages depending on when you decided to cancel your reservation. It, for the life of me, I, I never understand that concept because just give me an example. I think in New York, they don't have that. It's just on mm -hmm. on refundable. Mm -hmm. uh, but here in California, maybe we're dealing with a different um, situation where I am aware of a lot of applicants not being not being able to afford the amount of money that we charge them. And so I think it makes sense to refund uh, or issue a refund for those applicants who really need the money, who decided it's, you know, for whatever reasons, family or, or personal reasons that they can't take the bar. But what I'm really suggesting is perhaps we could just see this, simplify the process, just decide how much money it costs us upfront fees. I think you already mentioned that what the upfront fees would be, and then just, you know, and tick that and then issue whatever, you know, fees remaining that it would have gone to say for grading or administration fees or whatnot, and just give that money back to the applicants. That would be the easiest, the most simplified version versus, I mean, looking at right now, the, the Jesus, um, the, the state bar page, you have 45 days to get this percentage, 35 days to get this percentage, 30 days. I mean, this is not a math exercise, but, but I mean, I don't know why it's so complicated. Anyone understand that? Why we decided to do it this way? So you're looking at the withdrawal deadlines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's for exactly. applicants who want to withdraw prior to the exam, and we do give them a portion of their money back exactly. based on the timing. Right. Um, so that is what that is referring to. But what we were really going at is, do we really want that no-show flat fee penalty? And from what I'm hearing from some of the committee already is that there's an agreement that what we keep already in their exam fees is appropriate and that there should not be another 
fee for being a no-show put on top of that. And that's what I'm hearing, but I just want to make sure that's how the that the whole committee is looking at it. And Robbie, no, people can't hear you when you don't speak into oh, the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. You, you, have, you have expressed my, certainly my, I feel like that is quite a, a Thank you, a Ashley. Penalty. It seems like it would, to charge more, kind of following up on, on Mr. Chan's comments would really be uh, above and beyond. If you don't come and you know you've passed all those deadlines Alex just mentioned, you're forfeiting your nearly $1,000 fee. I think that's certainly sufficient. Uh, yeah, and too. as Paul pointed out, we do save the money on the, I mean, there's a, a, an associated cost with the grading compilation and putting that all together per applicant that we that we gain. So I, I think it, it balances out. Yeah, a penalty would create the perverse situation where um, if you accept that the standard fee for the exam does not cover all of our costs, then by not showing up, you would be forced to pay a higher percentage of our costs than somebody who actually sat for the mm -hmm. exam. Now, maybe that incentivizes people if they you know, they sign up to go through with it, but I don't know that we care. That's their personal choice at that point, uh, you know, one of their liberties, so to speak. Yeah, if I can uh, provide comments too. So I definitely in support of uh, Mr. Chan's uh, comments as well. I guess um, in, in a lot of this conversation, there was discussion about at what point do you know, do they notify us so that seat kind of frees up uh, to provide access to someone else to take the test. Um, so I guess what's the process going to be for that um, if we do adopt this? So we have more to discuss in this policy okay. as we go through that. We'll be able to look at those different items. Mm -hmm. uh, for the purpose of this uh, conversation, I think we're at a point now where everybody is in agreement. We do not charge an additional no-show penalty and so that would mean no change to any refund policy, no addition, and we continue to do things as we currently do it. Okay. And, and that's, then, I think, we'll, we'll and, continue on. And to clarify, that's, um, I know Mr. Chan was speaking about the cost. Is it going to be 95%, 99%, or is that something to still be determined? We're still going to have that discussion because the last time we discussed this in April, there wasn't any real you know, agreement that anybody came to because of the fact of one recommendation was given only a 20% refund. Mm -hmm. And then right now the current is 95%. So we're, we'll get to yeah. that as we go through. And I can see that evolving because cost of business is going up and, you know, uh, things are changing with technology. So I guess that's something that you guys will have to analyze moving forward. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, one of the items that was in the agenda that was uh, something that the working group felt that was something that was appropriate at this point in time, but we wanted to open it up for discussion and just see how the committee felt about it, is the credit card processing fees. Um, when we process a refund to applicants for whatever reason, they are not, at this point, we do not refund their credit card processing fees unless there's a special reason that we do. And with the credit card processing fee, that is a fee that the bank has us cover for the credit card to be processed. We don't keep that money. It's just they pass the cost to us and we pass the cost to the applicant to use a credit card. Um, and that fee is charged right now 2.5% based on the total amount that the applicant's paying. Um, and so, we did offer with our new system the ability to do ACH payments, e-checks for our applicants. So that really makes it where, you know, now if they really don't want to pay the credit card processing fee, they can process a e-check with their checking account and avoid that fee. Uh, but however, when we are issuing refunds, we just wanted to find out the committee's view on, you know, should we refund those credit card processing fees to our applicants? And of course, if we do, that's not money that we've kept originally. So we would be providing that back to them. Plus we've paid it out to the bank. So just wanted to open that up for a little bit of discussion here to see how the committee feels about it. And, go ahead, Robbie, I'll go after you. Tim, what, what, what do we do currently? We do not refund the credit card processing fees. We charge them 2.5%. 
on the total of their charge. And then we do not refund that because we do not keep that money originally. Yeah, I think that's an, to my, that's an appropriate mm -hmm. withholding because we're out that money no matter whether they go for right. it or not. I think I would say no change there necessary. And to clarify, if, if we give a $1,000 refund, the bank doesn't undo any of the charges for that initial $1,000 fee? No, they do not. Okay. I want to make sure that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Sally. Is ACH an option? It is. Okay. We do have a CHE check option that applicants can choose to enter a, an account, bank account, and not pay the credit card processing fee. So if an applicant so chooses to use credit card to pay, they, they should be aware that there is a processing fee that we don't get to keep. But at the same time, there's an alternative would be for them to use ACH, which is no fee, um, which they will also get back if they ask for a refund. So I think that's a fair, uh, that's a fair uh, proposal. Okay, any other comments? Okay, so we will leave it, uh, the policy as it currently is. Next slide, please. Um, so now here's where we come to the 95% death medical refund of fees. Uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on first is the policy with regards to defining what an immediate family member is. And I know uh, in April we gave a list that we tried to cover various aspects, but after going back and looking at it, it was thought that really our refund of fees policy would be better suited just to reference the link to the California Family Leave Act or Family Rights Act, I should say, and that be the reference point of what did they consider to be an immediate family member, and that's what we would follow as our guideline. That way, if it's ever updated, it's you know a link to their website. That's the current version, and we're not trying to define it, you know, in our policy where we now have to go and update our policy every time there's a change to their website. So the recommendation is that. We just enter this information you see on the screen um, into our policy, and that will be where everybody can go to understand what an immediate family member is. Rather than link to a website, it, it's a statute, right? So would you link to the definition in that particular statute? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so if we're all on the same page there, we will continue to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is just a little bit of a refresher. We brought this up in April um, with regards to the ACH uh, e-check payments. That was not in our uh, refund of fees policy previously. Uh, with us moving into the AIM system, that being an option that we can provide now, we went ahead and added this in that this is a process that they will be able to utilize when making their payments. And that we talked about that last time and there weren't any changes or if there was, it was just simple language change. Uh, we did discuss last time the 90 day deadline to submit the refund requests. As of right now, there is no deadline for anybody to request a 95% death or medical refund of their fees. It's not the most common, but we do have applicants that have come along and requested it a year later, two years later. I, I know we've had one, I think, that did it five years later. And we're looking at doing this 90-day deadline, making it where not only if we make this change, would it be able to close out our exam administration sooner and say that everything has been processed with that exam and we're moving on to our next one. But when we start pulling our reports about how much revenue we've had and how many refunds we've made, and we're really analyzing all of our um, the cost and the revenue we're bringing in, it would allow us to have more accurate reflection because we've had a deadline, we've cut it off, and now we know moving forward, we've closed out the exam for that administration. Um, and then again, it just provides us with clear information on how many refunds did we request for each exam for this category, because right now we can say, well, okay, we had X amount that we did for the February exam, but we don't know how many more could still continue to come through for February the rest of this year or a year from now. So the 90-day deadline, I know last time there was, I think, some robust conversation about it, but I think we had come to a consensus, consensus that the 90-day deadline after each exam was an appropriate time frame. but I thought I would just bring it up one more time to see if there was any further comments about that. 
just to avoid ambiguity, make it from the first day of the mm -hmm. exam. Yes, and that was something requested in April, and I made that change to the policy. So when I bring it back, it will be reflected for the from the first day of the examination administration. Okay, so I'm not hearing any other uh, discussion. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so here uh, is where we're going to go into the 95% a little bit more. Uh, last time it was questioned, what is considered an administrative cost? So I reached out to our finance department and spoke with uh, our controller and just said, you know, from finance's perspective, what would you consider an administrative cost to be? And their response was that it would be any cost that we had already incurred for the administration of the exam up until that exam happened, which is, I think, the discussion we had in April, how everybody was looking at it. So based on finance, giving that same type of uh, definition from their perspective of what administrative costs are, we wanted to again, bring up again, is this 5% enough to cover costs in 2023? And I give the example on the screen, 5% of 677, uh, which is a general exam fee for a general applicant, is a refund of $643.15 to the applicant and an administrative fee of $33.85. So looking at that, it is 5% that valid number that we would keep for administrative costs. Um, and then one other area that we had looked at is for applicants who do start taking the exam and they have a medical emergency in the middle of the exam itself and they leave and they don't return, of course, to finish the exam. This was something that was brought up in prior years uh, to the CBE in the past. Should there be a 50% refund to those applicants because they did not complete the exam? But again, these applicants right now currently don't get a refund. If you come to the exam and then you leave and you don't stay, you're considered a partial taker and you are not getting a refund of your fees. This is also leading back to the conversation of, you know, with people having not being there, not being a no-show. I mean, do we want to give them the fees? Do they fall under a family member medical emergency for 95%? just opening this up for discussion so that we can look at how we want to handle these different scenarios. So this is Ravi. I'll, I guess I'll, I'll just say that I think that the 5% is appropriate and I would continue our policy of no refund for someone who, did, who starts the exam. I, I think there's too much wiggle room for medical emergency. I, I've seen many applicants say that they just don't want to complete the exam and to later say, well, I, you know, I, I had anxiety or I, I didn't want to. I, I think the costs have been borne by the bar once the exam has begun. So I, I would continue both the policies that are on the screen. So that's a no 50% refund if you start the exam and leave after the start due to a medical emergency and keeping the 5% for the family medical refund being the administrative cost portion. That would be my, I think they're both appropriate. Okay, and so now is there anybody else that wants to provide? Well, yeah, I'm I think always we... a support of Brody's uh, proposal, I have but I have, I have I one have... of my own. I, I, I... Okay. We, um, so to, I think 5% is too low. I just don't think it nearly is appropriate. Um, you know, I'd like to see maybe 15 or 20%, but at least 10%. 5% just doesn't cover our costs. And, uh, you know, I feel unfortunate for the individual who has the problem, but, you know, these are expenses that have to be paid by all the students who take the exam. And um, I just think 5% isn't enough. So I would vote for at least 10% or even more if we can get enough staff to stay or and members Vivian, to build up five ten percent. Okay, perfect. And Viviana, can you advance one more slide so everybody can see this now that we're talking about this five percent? This is a breakdown of everything that we spend in a percentage that we put out for the bar exam. And this is from start to finish. And we've also 
come up with a, a calculation to try to, you know, get an estimate in there of what we're looking at for uh, staff time spent from the start of setting up an application to packing and preparing everything uh, all the way to the end. So you can see, for example, it was brought up about grading and the grading of MBE booklets. Grading really only accounts for about 4.7% of our costs. The MBE booklets, it's only about 6.9%. So that right there shows you roughly about 11% of costs that are not um, something that we would pay for if an applicant uh, does not take the exam. However, you can see where the most time is spent is, you know, we've got the proctors, we've got the staff time. Those are the two biggest chunks, as well as our meeting space and our testing rooms that we uh, contract for for the testing itself. And then you've got uh, exam soft fees in there, electrical, and but it goes down into smaller percentages from there. So this was in hope to be able to help the committee to see how the percentages for what we spend on a bar exam work out. And this is based on February, so the most recent exam. Um, so this is really everything up until the exam, the staff time pretty much is all on that front end up until the exam. Uh, there is some staff time you could account for afterwards in the grading process, but if that's not happening, there's, there's no staff time to account for that. Uh, you can see what we spend on printing the essays and the PTs. It's only about 1% of our costs. So that's something that we've spent prior to the exam for an applicant who doesn't show up, but it's a you know small amount. So I'm hoping that you being able to see these numbers and these percentages will maybe help you guys look at what, what would be the percentage. Is it still 5% or is it something more? Um, I think we need to get some advice from council. Um, Viviana, if you can stop sharing for a minute, let me share the statute. And my question, Jean, just to get you started is, what uh, what is the reasonable definition of administrative costs? Because um, it sounds like the group is... Um, of the mind that we, sh you know, money we've already spent, we should not have to give back in this instance, but the statute may require more of us. Um, yes, this is something that um, staff, we have talked about, um, and in order to comply with the statute, so the statute is 6060.3, and in the case of um, the, instances where somebody has requested a refund due to the death of an immediate family member or serious illness or disabling injury, um, application fees, including late filing fees, shall be refunded. So it's a mandatory refund. Um, it does permit a deduction um, for administrative costs, but in order to determine what an appropriate administrative cost is, I think we would have to have finance run an analysis of that. And um, certainly not not something I can do on the fly this this morning. <laughs> well, but doesn't finance also need to have a standard by which to to give us that information? In other words, they need a definition, legal definition of administrative costs. They're real good yes, at turning right. up the numbers, but uh, so we have to start with that first. Um, is it simply our costs of issuing the refund, which probably aren't even five percent, um, or? Um, uh, I mean, I'm I'm not happy with the answer we're likely to get, mm. but but I think that's that's the approach we have to take to answer this question. And, but is it necessary for us to come up with a number, which is honestly pretty subjective? Not to mention it varies year by year, administration by administration. Instead can you project of, a little more? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you yeah. hear what I just said? I should repeat myself. It's um. Okay. So so. I, I don't think it's necessary for the CBE to come up with a number because one, it's highly subjective, but also that number would vary from year to year and administration to administration. Instead, what I'm really proposing is to be fair and equitable. And to do that, all we really need to do, and this is coming from me personally, is to just this, determine what the administrative cost is per administration, 
And then if an applicant decides not to take the bar on the day of the exam or takes the bar on the, on the day of the exam, but, but terminates it, you get, you know, you get the refund of whatever fees he or she pays minus the administrative cost. Again, that number could vary from year to year. And, and, and so essentially what he's really getting back is the money that he paid into the bar exam for grading purposes. So basically anything post administration of, of, of the exam. So whatever we didn't spend, but see, I'm not sure this statute allows us to, to approach it that way. Why not? Because again, I think you really said it. We don't have a, a, a statutory definition for administrative cost. So as soon as we, as a whole, decide what the definition should be, whatever it includes, right? Then it makes the math so much easier. Right now, you can look at the pie chart and just take out those things that fall within the administrative costs. I, I did do um, uh, a legislative history analysis um, on that, and there's no mention in the um, in the legislative analyses uh, that were prepared at the time of uh, what they what they intended with the word administrative cost, unfortunately or fortunately. But there's nothing to guide us from the legislative history on what that definition, what, what they intended to mean when they said that we could subtract those administrative costs. So then leaving it to us to define that? Well, it's a within reason. It's within reason. With okay. the administration of the subdivision, right. not that that is what our job is and that's what we're trying so, to do. Right, so what we can do, it sounds like everyone's in agreement, we can come up with our own version of the definition and then ask the board to adopt or ratify that definition that we can then subsequently use for future administration of the bar exam. No issue with that? Um, I'm happy to do that. I, I wonder if council is going to um, um, be comfortable. Um, my concern is that the term administrative cost appears um, throughout the State Bar Act, and um, I, I cannot tell you right now how we've interpreted that term in the various instances where it appears in the State Bar Act. So my concern would be that by coming up with a definition here today, we would not be considering necessarily how we've interpreted that same term um, in other instances. So, so that is just one consideration for, for you all. Okay, so how about if today we said to staff, go back, work on it. Um, our preference is that um, we not give back monies that we've had to commit because this person asked us to be able to take the bar exam, but only that which we haven't really spent. That is a true variable cost of their participation in our program. Does that make sense? Agreed. Alex is not in yes. It does. So staff is going to have to go look and see how far we can go. Um, <laughs> it's uh, between between ninety or ninety five percent return to the um, requester or and zero. Right. How far we can equitably go? Mm -hmm. Ashley. Yeah, I, I was going to say that equitable equitably part is going to be, I think, key because I don't think that we should be gunning for the maximum amount that we can possibly get back from an applicant who potentially died or in a different circumstance could be incapacitated. Mm -hmm. So they're suffering from pretty debilitating disabilities to want to ask for these kinds of refunds. And then the state bar comes in and is like, hey, we're actually only going to give you like 60 bucks. So I also want to hesitate to say that even if we find out that the definition of an administrative cost maybe does meet up to maybe, I know that there was like a proposal to reduce the 95% to 20% refund. Even if we can go down to a 20% refund, I still don't think that we should. I don't think that that's something that we should anticipate even approving if we do find that the administrative costs would allow us to. So I do wanna kind of flag that for when we get to a bigger conversation. Okay, so so you might have a different view of it once we are informed of what our options are. I think, I okay. think my, my, my stance would not change. <laughs> okay. Can I respond to this? Because this is just something that was discussed earlier by the schools and that we're raising their fees significantly, which they're gonna pass on to their students. 
We've been directed, as I understand, from the Board of Trustees to be essentially bring in the money we need to cover our expenses. So every time we reduce a fee to one person, we add a fee to a second person. Mm. It doesn't go away. So if we are equitable with this person and I feel sorry for the person because of their problem, we're not saying we're going to pay it. We're saying all those other people are going to have to pay your bill because we don't think you should have to pay it. And I don't think that's equitable either. Mm. I think we have to remember who's paying the bill when the person who incurred the expense doesn't okay. pay the bill. Okay, well, um, so probably that's a debate to have the next time once we know what what um, is supportable under the statute. If I may, I would highly, highly advise us against putting a fixed percentage into any future proposal because I can easily come up with a scenario where, where an applicant could have gotten more money back but for the fact that we have this fixed percentage in the current uh, in the current rule, and that's certainly not fair or equitable in any way, shape, or form. But if we don't have a standard, then what do yeah. they apply? And well, that's why I think every year we need to look at how much money we really spent and 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 really decide what that number should be on a yearly basis. Because I can imagine a scenario where we may have a lot less applicants, for example, for a specific administration, where we may have paid a lot less for hotel costs or staff or proctors, right? Under those scenarios, obviously the spend would be would have been a lot less. Right. So under right. those circumstances, an applicant should have gotten more money back for that specific administration. I well, think. we don't want to have to do an applicant by applicant account. Exam by exam. Because the cost for the accountants to do that will exceed the, the refund. I understand. Um, so we that. have to make reasonable approximations. Right. It's not, what I'm hearing from you is we should do that on a more frequent basis than we do now. Perhaps. Well, I think that's really the burden on the bar. But again, to be fair and equitable, where an applicant should really have gotten their money back, we can't just just think about well, maybe it's much easier for the state bar not to do the analysis when an applicant really deserved that money back, because really we're keeping money that we didn't spend. Yeah, I think if we if we check there, there's a lot less of that money that was on spent than the, than the we sunk would costs think. are mostly upfront. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. because we we can't overbook like the airlines and you know, and hope or rely on a certain number of people to not show up. Um, oh. Because if they do more than we expect to show up, we have a problem. So we, we have to, we have to obtain the space necessary to serve the people that signed up. And because we contract a year or more in advance, you know, we, we can't um, order up, you know, 978 room, uh, seats at a particular place and pay only for that. We have to, you know, get 1200 or whatever to be safe. Yeah, but what you're telling me now is if we are able to book things a year in advance, we should have known the costs at the time when applicants submit their applications. Yeah, and we So do. what's the problem? Well, first of all, the applicants aren't paying the full price, um, the full cost, um, and that's a policy decision that's been made. Um, so, you know, it, it, it all is just, averaging making our best guess and uh, the courts are going to support us if we you know if we make reasonable assumptions and, and do the math correctly um and i think that's the best we can do absolutely i'm, I'm not asking for us to go all the way down to the pennies I, that, that's not what i'm suggesting what i'm saying is we should revisit this on a yearly basis again subject to the entire committee's approval to look at what that number should be and adjust accordingly instead of just putting some fixed number where an applicant should have gotten money back, but for the fact that we have this fixed percentage that's highly subjective. Okay, and, and I did hear- the change year to year. And the Board of Trustees is talking, or some of them were at least talking about reviewing fees and costs more frequently than every five mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And we probably haven't reviewed ours even that frequently. Right, and so in, in parallel, we should really come up with a rule that sort of mirrors that practice where we, review those numbers either every couple of years or every year, but we don't have such a rule. Yeah, but for any given exam, we have to have a percentage. So when the request comes in, we can apply it, right? Uh, I was subject to the entire committee's uh, discussion on that, but personally, I don't know if percentage would work. It's my personal opinion. The, 
Do you have your anything else, Robbie? I, I just wanted to quickly, you know, I, you know, I, I always am all about uh, what uh, Mr. Chan has to say. He's always right, but I, there, there are as as Alex pointed out, there are so many variables with each exam, whether it's going to be remote, whether it's going to be in person, whether it's the February exam, which is smaller. That's why I like the 5%. It's just enough to keep something that we can maintain throughout the years. But Tammy, I do want to ask before we put your your group to any more work, what, what are we talking about here? Like one per session, one or two? I mean, is this a very small percentage of people that would qualify, as Ashley pointed out, for a very limited review, we're talking about a, a serious, and it's right there in, in the statute. What are we talking about here in terms for of- For the number of refunds? Just just anecdotally, is it-, is it And I think the number has gone up with, with COVID, post-pandemic. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's different vari variations of refunds because of COVID, but I can tell you that for the July 22 exam, we had- let me do 65. Looks like we had roughly 65 refunds requested for the July 2022 bar exam. And how, how many were, how many did, did you approve? This is all of the ones that we process. So that I don't know how many were denied. That's we I've got numbers based on what are the refunds we approved. So those 65 met the qualifications in terms of whatever documentation and, and stuff that they had to provide to us, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's for the July exam out of almost 10,000, that's like, well. No, it's not 10,000. Yeah, it I was far fewer than 10,000. No, what that's... was the number? I forget what it was, like by seven, 75 or five something like that. Alex, Alex Chan knows. So what's that, like 1%, 2%? Well, you know, for, for my money, I say the way we have it now is probably appropriate without spending a lot of staff time on a very small number of requests like this. It, it may not accurately define what our loss is, but I just think that, uh, you know, to be equitable and fair, uh, you know, those are costs that maybe we, we might bear if someone were to meet are, are pretty stringent requirements for even making the request. So that's all I have to say. Well, I'm prepared to go back to the drawing board. Mr. Chair, would you like us to a motion to table these issues or? Well, I think Tammy's taking yeah. feedback. So, yes. so we're gonna, you have your, you feel like you have clear marching orders to go I research and so, come yes. back. And there is no motion tied to this because it was just for discussion to bring it back for a motion next time. Um, so okay. I- so take all this information as a lot of the stuff we were able to solidify, but for this one area, we will come back again in August and go over that in further review. Was that your last? Um, I know policy? there's more. There's one more item. So Viviana is going to uh, reshare again and go to the next slide. This is the one that we have for motion today. And that's before huh? you proceed to that. Just one yeah. more thing for, uh, for the group to take back as they're considering is, um, is and it was raised in the agenda item um, whether um, the, whether the statute does per, permit you to say if you've shown up at the exam and start to take the exam then you don't qualify for that 95 percent refund i am not in favor of that interpretation of the statute and i really don't think it's in in the spirit of the statute um, as well and so that's something that i think that that the group should be considering as they're going So showing up is taking uh, for purposes of the statutory language. Right. So that's the way clearly we we've interpreted the statute is using the using the word take in the statute. It's somebody who somebody who doesn't take the exam is entitled to that refund. In other contexts, we have a different different definition of taking right. the exam, right? When we talk about the NPR, for example, it's a different definition of take. Right. You have um, to complete it uh, right. to get a score. Right. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody object to that, that um, once you start the exam, the, 
death or serious illness of you or a family member no longer entitles you to a refund? I don't know how many people would be in no, that I category. Agree. Donna, were you saying, I'm sorry, I got a little mixed up there. Were you saying that if you start it and then you don't complete it, you might be entitled to be considered for a refund? Yes. Um, our, currently, we don't give you a right. refund if you start and then leave the exam and and provide the medical documentation that you or a family immediate family member suffered from a serious or disabling injury. We don't provide that refund. I'm saying that I'm not comfortable with that interpretation of the statute, and and I would like you all to be discussing when you when David sort of takes that back with the working group discussing changing that part of the policy so we would in fact allow them to submit a request for a refund in that instance. Oh, okay. I heard you did the opposite way. That's fine. Um, so in considering that, um, when someone does, and maybe this is a question for Tammy, um, when someone does um, get sick or experiences a death in the family or gets notice of that during an exam, is it our practice to toss their materials? Or if it's closer to the end of the administration, do they have the choice to submit it for grading and hope that maybe missing uh, the minimal amount at the end is enough to pass? So I just took over grading. So right. I'm gonna look at Christina to help me if I'm incorrect with what I'm saying, Christina. <laughs> so my understanding is if you did not sit and provide an answer for every single session, you are not considered a taker. You are a partial and I am getting a not of a yes here, so I'm gonna <laughs> doing training well. Um, so that at this point, you can only be considered a taker if you've provided an answer for every single session. Okay. And I think that's what we talked about the last time, right? Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> how long is the, this one should be pretty brief. Um, hopefully, yeah. Okay, then we're going to take a break. <laughs> um, so this is the uh, rejected payments policy. Last time we asked for the committee to accept us bringing a policy back. So this time we just decided to bring a policy. This is what the policy would consist of right here, which basically just identifies that a payment has to be successfully settled uh, in order for, you know, and if, to not be considered incomplete. So an application is not considered complete if not all components are done. So no payment means an application is incomplete. So an unsuccessful payment or rejected payment includes, but is not limited to return checks, declined ACH payments, or credit card chargebacks requested by the credit card holder. All rejected payments, of course, which we our current policy is we assess a $20 insufficient payment fee for that. And if an acceptable payment is not received within 14 days from notification of the insufficient payment from us, the state bar, the application will be deemed abandoned or they will just no longer be able to sit for the exam. And they do have the option to resubmit an application if they want, if the application is still open. And if the application final filing deadline has not passed, and you know, so the applicant can do so. Uh, the other aspect is just pointing out that if they did submit uh, the payment right before the deadline, we would still allow them to have the 14 days past the final filing deadline once we notified them. So just trying to put something into a policy, and this is what we came up with. And if there's anybody who would like to add to that, but there is also a motion that we have to put up first before we can do that discussion. Yeah, this is a place where I think Rosenberg got it wrong, but whatever. So, of course, we have a motion for the committee to approve the rejected fee policy that was just on the screen. Uh, and at this point, now we can open it up if there's any discussion with regards to the content of that we, policy. Somebody want to move and second this, and then we'll have a discussion? Thank you, Marcia. I'll right. second. Is that David? Tor second. Okay, Tor second. Okay, thank you. Um, any, I have a couple of questions, but any one of you first. Okay, um, can we put the policy back up, Viviana? Um, first of all, um, Tammy, uh, does anybody, any bank only charge $20 for a 
a bounce check these days of you? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think it might be more. <laughs> um, $20 sounds low, so maybe we want to make that higher to match that, it, although it probably varies. But um, I think you'd be easily justified to be higher. Um, uh, and the second point is, we mix the terms in there. It, sometimes we call it insufficient payment and sometimes unsuccessful. I think it'd be better if we settled on one and used the same term throughout. Okay, so we can change that. Um, we can put it up there on the screen right now and change it. Viviani, are you okay with changing that on the screen? So do you guys prefer the unsuccessful or insufficient? Unsuccessful. No, Viviana, you can um, do it in the actual PowerPoint, please. Sorry. That way they can see what the policy looks like before they go to motion. Now, would it be enough to simply say, as part of the motion that we're changing, use mm -hmm. substituting unsuccessful where in, insufficient is used? Yeah. Unless there's a place where it says insufficient funds, which is a banking term. Um, is there a preference that we how we should do this? I don't have one, but um, I'll flip an imaginary coin and go with unsuccessful. Not the resolution, it's the policy. Change to the policy yeah. that we don't say insufficient, that we say. I mean, I think we could just we could just let you fix that later. I'm happy with that. Does anyone else really need to see it? I have another question. Okay. I think it's unclear whether they have to pay both the penalty and the fee within the 14 days. And I think that could be clear. Oh, clarify that. That's a good point. So we need the policy, policy up, in, up. I guess, as a word file. Jim, can you repeat that point on the 14 days? It's not clear whether both the penalty and the fee have to be paid within the 14 days, in my view. Well, I didn't realize she was in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Would it would it be easier if I just reword this and bring it back in August to get the final motion? Is that something That's soon enough for your purposes? I mean, at this point, if, you know, if we're going to have to go in and, and make substantial changes, it'd probably be better for me to do it and bring it back. And hopefully at that point, it'll be a, a quick motion. Hey, Viviana, just let me share. I don't want me to share. Well, we wanted to look at the 14 days part. Okay. Now, now this is the actual policy that was attached. So this is I, where I we changed this to it. unsuccessful, right? Or, or here too. So there's a question about the $20, but I guess the thing is, is I don't know what banks are charging for like a bounce check fee nowadays. So is there something that one of the committee members wants to put a number onto that so that we can make that change now? We say the greater of what the bank charges the state bar or twenty dollars. Greater than, yeah. I don't even know what the bank charges if we have one that comes through. Whatever. So whatever the bank charges, that twenty dollars or greater, basically. However, we're going to word that. We're just recovering whatever we're being charged. Right. Okay, I missed part of the wording. And you want to say the bars banking institution? Maybe?
Did you fix the other thing already? The unsuccessful, yeah. But not the issue with the 14 page. Insufficient change to unsuccessful. I think so. But if the, the bank charges less, we still want twenty dollars to be the yeah, because that's not even covering our you know the fact that we had to pick up the file and uh, or send the email and yeah, reprocess make notice or could it be all insufficient payment? Oh no, you're right. Again, we're calling unsuccessful, all unsuccessful payments rather than all rejected payments. <laughs> In the first part of that paragraph there. All rejected payments will be assessed. Um, you want me to put, uh, I think that his, he assessed, we don't need this, these two words here. Really. Supposed to be the greater of. So the bank charges thirty to be charged twenty. The bank charges nothing. Did they resolve that for twenty dollars, whichever is greater, the larger, whatever you call it. We got it. Oh no. So we've updated the wording. We've changed to accommodate for what the bank actually charges. Was there any other changes that you? It was a question on the fourteen days. Whether the penalty as well as the fee had to be paid in the 14 days. Penalty being that $20 or the fee, bank fee? Yeah. Yeah, they do have to pay both of them. If we want to accept them, it's not risk. So we could save acceptable payment plus. Or just payments. Payments. They owe two payments. Yeah, if payment is okay. not received. Full, or you maybe say full payment. To eliminate somebody. That's why I think if he's. Payments plural it implies there are two payments that are due now. But do you have to deal with it? I only have to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How's that? I can, I'm happy with that. Or maybe combine that, make that onto one paragraph. This part? It surely, surely relates, yeah. It's, it's just, I think some of it's my formatting too, so. Taking it from the computer. Everyone happy with that? Everyone see it okay? As long as staff feels they can work with it. Oh, there's a word. Yeah, there's a word missing. An unsuccessful payment. Yes. It is, yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Oops. So that's the final product for everybody to look at. Any other changes? If not, we can put the motion back up. We already had a motion on the floor. So oh, any, right. any further discussion? The motion would be to adopt the policy as it is on the screen. Um, take the roll. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Alex Chan? Jim Efting? Yes. Kareem Gangora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger, Larry Kaplan, yes. Alex Lawrence, yes, Esther Lynn, Bethany Peak, Ashley Silva Guzman, yes, Vince Reyes, yes, 
David Torres? Yes. Paul Kramer? Yes. With 12 yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. Okay, let's um, thank you all. Um, thank you, Tammy. Uh, let's take a, um, let's come back. Uh, we'll take a nine minute break, come back at 1125.
Um, and the next item is under um, educational standards, I believe. Um, the first item is uh, the report of administrative changes and updates um, at the various law schools. Um, and unless somebody has a question, that's just a, um, I received, do we even need a motion on that, Natalie? We don't need a motion. I have just one okay. point of clarification after Jim makes any comments. Okay, Jim, do you wanna say anything about this? Otherwise we'll just um, let it go and move on. I don't on. think I do, do I? Uh, no. I think it's pretty straightforward. You'll notice this time there's a section that's not usually included, which is ABA related updates uh, because there were several and it's important for the committee to keep up on what's going on with all law schools. Um, one of those is that the section um, at the ABA passed a proposal to consider uh, allowing up to 50% distance versus the current 30% limit. The section has passed that proposal. But much as the CBE works with the Board of Trustees, um, the section reports up to the House of Delegates, which meets at the beginning of August. And so that has been approved to go for further discussion to the House of Delegates in August. I just wanted to make that clear. And the ABA is also looking at an additional layer of corrective action that could be instituted prior to probation. And uh, the details of that are in there. So that's why you see that extra section. Do you see that um, that second change to have any instructive value for us? Um, at this point, I, I'm not certain. It's still an open discussion there, uh, but I, I do think that that's something to bring back to the group that's doing the unaccredited rules review uh, to see if it may have any application or certainly to just keep posted as that discussion continues. Okay. The public comment period just closed, and so... I'm looking to see if we can find um, anything out about the public comment and the further discussion. Okay, anything else on uh, item A updates? Okay, the next one is um, People's College of Law, um, action on their probation and progress report and a request for a waiver to teach classes online due to COVID and a major change involving the uh, change of administrative headquarters. So, Jim, uh, you and Natalie are going to lead this one. Oh, we were waiting for people to talk first. Um, actually, well, usually I give the staff presentation first, but Devin, would you mind just checking the audience to see if there is a representative from Peoples? I didn't receive notice that they would attend, and they're not required to do so. Okay, so we'll let them comment after your staff presentation if they're there. Okay. I do see Dean Pomposo there. I'm, I'm sorry, you do? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I missed that. Oh, uh, they do have a representative here. So after my presentation, they'll give their public comment. Do you have any comments before I begin, Jim? No, why don't you start? Okay. Uh, so as you know, the committee placed People's College of Law and Probation in December and has asked the school to uh, monthly provide progress reports, which they have been doing. Um, since the committee last met, a report was provided in May and in June. Um, originally, the Committee believed that there should be a touch point in October, uh, but due to the number of issues seen so far, the committee has been receiving reports at each meeting. Um, and I think that the events of uh, these two progress reports would suggest the wisdom of that decision. Um, in, Mar in May, the, the report was very challenging. Uh, it omitted many of the questions that were asked by the committee either in prior meetings or also the most recent motion uh, there was a section asking about disclosures and asking about notice to students with uh, five specific questions, and none of those were addressed in the May response. Uh, staff spent a large amount of time going through the report and indicating the omissions, providing those to the school and asking for a resubmission of the May response, but no uh, resubmission was created. Instead, the school went forward to the June response. Some of those things were included and uh, some, frankly, were not. Uh, staff has several concerns about the school's choices during promotion uh, during probation. The first one is that um, th they simply disregard uh, committee directives. That's very concerning for any school. It's specifically concerning during probation. In addition, 
they seem comfortable with a very elongated time period. So for example, the committee has been hearing about the required disclosures that the school must give um, since January, but at this point, uh, those were not mentioned in May. And in June, the school advised that they needed an additional 12 weeks to receive permission from their board to give refunds that were due, to calculate what those refunds should be, and to identify who should receive them, finally paying them out at the end of August. This is very curious given that ultimately when the school seemed unable to do so, staff identified those individuals and identified those amounts based on materials that the school provided. So we are concerned about the school's commitment to implementing um, its requirements. In addition, we continue to get very late responses from the school calling into question their planning. So for example, staff identified a, an error that was in the web posted disclosure um, and we talked with them on approximately June 9th. It really just involved updating tuition and fees. The update was received this morning. Uh -huh. um, similarly, two additional major changes were placed into the June 1 uh, progress report. It makes it very challenging for staff to review. Um, and it's very concerning how much they're continuing to change course at this time. Uh, those two motions, the first involved a change of administrative headquarters. We understand that the school is in the process of selling its building. Um, they have not provided the details, the amount, the funds that will be available, those, though those funds are identified uh, as necessary to complete the probationary conditions. We do not know the criteria that the school will use to select a new space. Um, we do not know when a space uh, will be available. So it's very difficult to advise the committee. Um, and it's very concerning that at this late date, uh, they are not sure how they will operate in the fall. Um, in addition, they recently filed a petition to change, um, to ask for an extension of their COVID waiver. But we've been talking with them and all schools for the past three years, but in particular this year, to indicate that this is the last point at which those COVID emergency waivers can happen. Um, instead, at this point, now that the schools have had three years, they can make a, a considered change and file the proper major change request. Um, when I reminded the school of this um, and showed them some of the writings and conversations we had, they did review that re request and decide to withdraw it, um, but leaving us uncertain if they truly are ready to teach in a fixed facility fashion in the fall, given the pending sale of the school's building. Uh, so that's a little bit of the background. And as a result, um, staff has an updated motion, uh, which includes requesting supplementation of the major change regarding the headquarters. It is moot to decide on the waiver because the school has withdrawn it. Um, and then a further review of the probation conditions. And after speaking uh, with the educational standards leadership, um, several additional changes beyond the original motion are proposed. And I'd ask if that could be uh, put up now um, in the track change format so that committee members can see the original motion that's in the staff memorandum, as well as the additional changes, which will be in red track change format. And the changes really are designed to do the following. First, to make clear that the school does need prior approval if it wishes to change to the distance category, therefore it must act quickly uh, if it hopes that the committee will hear a motion um, in August. A second, uh, the school is planning to change administrative headquarters, reminding that that is also a pre-approval motion. A sufficient motion with enough information for the committee to evaluate should be refiled timely along with the July progress report so that uh, action can be taken if appropriate at the committee's meeting. And finally, reminding the school that they must provide clear notice to current students and, pro and prospective students um, as well of the status of the school so that they can make an informed decision when choosing whether to continue their legal education at the school or start their legal education at the school. 
clarification. So they've withdrawn their uh, motion for a permanent change to distant learning category. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And, and that uh, portion of it has been removed from this entire list. That's correct. The reason that uh, staff left that in the motion was because, again, uh, we are acting on a very short time frame. We were advised as of June 1st. It was just very recently we were advised that the motion was withdrawn. So um, making the clear statement to the school of what they would need if they decide to change again, uh, given the uncertainty in the administrative headquarters, seemed important. We go back to that section, then, which is, I think, at the top. Do we need to go up one more paragraph? There we go. So Jim, one possibility, depending on what you think is appropriate, is to leave the distance information in there. It doesn't require the school to file a motion to change to the distance category, but it gives clarity. Um, it doesn't create any new requirements for them that wouldn't apply to any other school. Uh, it just reinforces what's needed in case they're is a further change. So I think it should stay in there, yes. Okay. Who's, who's sharing the document? Audrey. Audrey. So uh, do we want to hear from the school or hear from me first? I, I think it would be appropriate to hear from the school prior to opening the committee discussion. Who's sharing the screen? Yes, Audrey. Oh, I'm sharing my screen. I see Dean Pomposo in the Cool, but she, she does not have her hand raised. Oh, her hand is raised now. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, Dean Pomposo, if you wouldn't mind holding just a moment sure. until we have the, the chair's um, ability <laughs> to join us. I'll pull it down too, so Audrey. Uh, Thank you for your patience. Right It'll be just a moment. Chair Kramer, are we ready to proceed? Yeah, I was just to trying record. to get more screen real estate for us. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay, uh, Devin, yes, please recognize the school's representatives for a total of five minutes of public comment. Thank you. Dean, when you're ready. Yes, thank you. Well, um, I just wanted to thank um, the Committee of Bar Examiners for the thorough report that um, was provided to us. I, I really feel that this is a, a team approach and that um, we are slowly but surely coming into compliance. Um, PC, under my leadership, um, it, which started in September, I arrived and um, I had several points of, there were several um, items of noncompliance. Um, it's, um, it, it has been a bit of a challenge since September, um, but um, I'm still confident that we can fix these challenges. Much of the challenges, as I'm speaking as a whole, have to deal with, um, with capacity issues. And uh, that is no surprise. Um, we must build capacity right away and quickly. And that is something that I have illustrated to the, um, and, and have been very open and candid to our board of directors, our president as the PCL community. So um, as we stand currently, um, I, I realize it is the end of, of uh, June and we are approaching the summer. Um, in my 20 years of uh, education um, experience, we usually take the summers to prepare for the upcoming school year. Um, we do um, have a, a challenge right now in the fact that the um, building is being sold and um, we are acquiring a new building. The reason why we are acquiring, or it has taken a little bit of a process, is because we are seeking a building in which we can have an excess of, of uh, resources left so that we can staff appropriately. Um, but as such, um, the uh, board of directors just met this past Wednesday, and um, was it? yes, this past Wednesday, and um, we uh, did secure a building, and we are making an offer on it. We're uh, pretty pretty hopeful that it's going to go through. 
once that is accepted, then we will um, be moving into our new facility right away. I understand, which is the reason why I provided um, long range uh, deadlines to come into compliance um, by the, um, which is why the reason why why the um, why the deadlines were far in advance were, were out of, of several weeks because I anticipated that the building would come through and then we would be able to um, staff appropriately. Um, yeah, so this is where we stand now. Um, we are still pretty confident once the building sells, we will have a, a very good access uh, to build resources. Uh, we will come into compliance with purchasing the library. We have already um, identified the volumes that need to be purchased. Uh, we're working on the estimate. So um, once that takes place, then um, we will just, um, I, I'm working on the job descriptions as well, so that when, once we have the excess of resources, we can um, build out, um, build, build out um, our, our capacity. And, um, that, and, and, and that is, that, that's all that I have for now. Okay, thank you, Dean Pomposo. Uh, Jim, would you like any sort of staff response before the discussion is opened? Uh, yeah, it's probably good. But okay. There are a few new things mentioned here. Okay, a um, couple of the things. So related to the move, um, it's concerning that information was known but not shared uh, with the committee and, and that a purchase is in place. Um, if the purchase meets the approval of the committee, this will be excellent. Um, if not, it certainly is, is a challenge and it is a bold move on behalf of the school. Um, second, it is a challenge to work with the school in a timely way. Here we ask the school, because the board was meeting on the 18th, to please provide an update that the committee could consider on several topics. The first one, any update related to the building. Uh, the second one, any update related to the refunds that have been owed to students for many months now? Um, the school identified as the identified the board approval as a key to that. We are not certain why board approval from the school is necessary for refunds that are required by the rules that the school so identified, and we do not know if the board did approve it, and if it did not, um, what the school attend, intends to do. Um, and in addition. We tend to see uh, progress that has been challenging to rely upon. So for example, um, in the area of the library, initially insurance funds were set aside for the purchase. Uh, later, a bequest, uh, those funds were not available and a bequest was set aside for the purchase. Uh, today, the committee hears that the purchase of a less costly building will provide those funds. Um, and so we're not sure of these rotation of options. A similar example would be in the area of uh, providing grading. Each semester, the school has not been able to deliver its grades on time to students uh, from at least one or two professors. Uh, in the fall, for example, the school indicated that it created a procedure that would be a backup so that this would never happen again. Unfortunately, in the spring, it happened twice. And we asked the school to evaluate the proposal that they did in the fall, had they used it? Why did it work? Why did it not? They've never responded. Um, and instead, they've created a new plan um, that would be used in the future to uh, prevent. And so we're, we're unsure how to assess the progress. So I think that context may be helpful as you move to discussion and questions. So we have a fairly lengthy proposed um, motion if you could hear me, if we can put that on the screen. Um, and I'm gonna kind of walk you through it because it is fairly lengthy. The first one, first paragraph moves is pretty basic. It just basically says we did receive uh, documents from the school and that they should be um, filed with the state bar. The second one, um, just to remind them that they, um, 
later incomplete, inconsistent um, pro progress reports um, are going to be considered. Um, and failure to comply with those um, is a serious issue with this committee um, and appropriate action may be required if they aren't complying with it. The third one um, uh, was it had to do with the distance learning and we understand they've withdrawn the request for distance learning, but we wanna make it clear that they are, you absolutely do not have permission for listen, distance learning at this time. That we don't wanna hear uh, in a month or two or a year from now that they started distance learning and seeking permission. Right now, it's clear they do not have permission for distance learning. Did we go over the rule, the disclosure rule one? Sorry. Excuse me? Did we, did we speak about this, the rule 4.241, the disclosures? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. That's okay. Um, yeah, and that's the one. It's hard to read both. I know, <laughs> sorry. sorry. Um, Should that one have a deadline though? I mean, to be honest, the committee has been asking for immediate compliance yes. since January. Okay, but is that clear? Because um, where I am on this is um, this, it was, this probation was never meant to be a time period in which they could wait until the end of the period to show compliance. What we, we imposed this probation in part because there was a kind of a, there was a pattern of coming into compliance and then failing to sustain compliance that's gone back at least until 2020, maybe earlier. And we wanted to end that, um, that roller coaster ride, if you will. Um, and so we were expecting that they be fully compliant by the end of the probation period, but also be demonstrating to us during the probation period that they were sustaining compliance. Um, you know, if they, they got something right, they were, they were not um, falling back again. And so in my mind, um, you know, we, we need to see the pattern of sustained compliance um, by the end of the probationary period and, and waiting until the end to show compliance in the first instance doesn't do that. And so, I, so having a specific deadline for this again, um, against which then we can maybe at our next meeting test, and if we don't have this response and things are in a particular state, uh, we may be on the verge of or ready to um, take action to and terminate. At this point, um, the school did provide a timeline, but the timeline is a challenge. It suggests that they will achieve compliance by the end of August, uh, which means that it could reasonably be after the committee's August meeting, uh, maybe too soon for the September 1st progress report. Um, and so the timeline that the school provided, um, if accepted by the committee, uh, might not give you a basis to evaluate until October. So maybe a question for the group is, should we accelerate them? their um, the schedule they gave us is that possible on their part um, Paul can this is a good discussion I, I want to continue it but can we kind of walk through the rest of it because okay there are important points here that that I think the school's got some real issues with and whether or not they even can ever be in compliance um, gotcha my, my purpose of this particular paragraph is the um, this final line, for which failure to comply can result in termination of registration, makes it clear to them that the next step after probation is termination. And we're not there yet, but I want the school to be well aware that that's out there and, and can happen at the next meeting or the following meeting, depending on what we do today. So that's the reason I suggested that. Um, again, back to the, the distance learning, I think I covered that already. But somebody has more questions. Um, then we've got further motion. Law school is directed to supplement its uh, major change request. And this has to do with the moving. And um, I understand they're selling their building. They want to buy a new building. But I want to make it real clear. They do not have permission to teach anywhere other than their present building until this committee grants that permission. 
And if they buy a new building and that building is not acceptable to the committee, they will not be able to teach there. Uh, at least that's what my proposal is. Right now they have permission to teach at one facility and that's the only place they can teach. So that's the language I'm trying to apply in, in that particular uh, paragraph. Question. Um, my understanding, thank you, Jim, that's a very good summary. So it sounds like they have withdrawn their request for long distance learning, is that correct? We believe so, but we still wanna make it clear they cannot do that. Absolutely. Um, setting that aside for a second, uh, and it sounds like the dean is still on the phone, but what's the reason behind um, uh, seeking to um, uh, teach remotely? Uh, is there a specific reason? Because the way I see it is, I, this, is a very, this is like a conundrum. On the one hand, you know, they're building up resources financially, otherwise, right, by selling buildings and buying a new one where they could have enough capacity or enough staff to to sustain the compliance but on the other hand we certainly have rules they have to abide by and certain compliance they have to follow and and, and so the real conundrum for them is 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 you know how we how can we help them sustain not not, not just survival but also longevity of school that that's really the the key question and 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 if the issue is well perhaps maybe by seeking to teach remotely or, or through the uh, um you know, long distance learning program that by that means that they can, you know, perhaps build up the resources uh, to sustain compliance, then I would like to know that. Um, but it, but but still, I'm, I'm very concerned that they haven't really followed the deadlines that we have uh, prescribed. And that's very concerning. And so my question is, um, I, I think the answer is yes, but, you know, it's worth repeating. Have we worked with them in terms of coming up part deadlines that they can abide by that would be acceptable to us? Um, in any particular instance or overall? Overall, just going forward in terms of helping them sustain survival and longevity uh, of the city. Sure. Um, I mean, even prior to the inspection, which took place in 2020, um, we've worked with staff in general, myself and others have worked with the school uh, to talk with them about what the perceived level of compliance is um, and what options could be. Um, here, in the case of the distance scenario, they actually have never asked for permanent switch to distance. Uh, rather, they asked for one, um, one additional waiver due to the COVID emergency, but this is an emergency that has now ended. Um, and their concern was based on the health of their population. Uh, rather than a desire to permanently change to distance. Um, for Since 2020, we've talked to them about what the requirements would be for the library and other scenarios if they went to distance versus fixed facility. Um, and they generally have wanted to teach via distance over the pandemic, but have wanted to uh, come back to fixed facility later. Um, and I, I was honestly quite surprised to get that waiver request, A, because the waiver time period was passed, but B, because it conflicted with what they said. Um, similarly, with the capacity building argument, um, the 2020 report very clearly identifies capacity as an issue. And sometimes you try things and, and they don't work and you have to continue to iterate. Um, but it is challenging to hear three years later, they're still at a short staffed scenario. But yes, we, we work with this school, but all schools uh, very closely to talk about things that they've shared, but also other ideas that we may have based on what other schools have done or portions of the rules with which they may be less familiar. When's the next inspection, if there is one? Uh, there is an inspection baked into the probationary period. Right. So it is something that we would likely conduct later this year or the beginning of next year. Um, one challenge with this school versus others is that for many things such as the disclosures, um, they generally would be handled, I mean, almost immediately. And here, things linger. And sometimes upon lingering, additional issues emerge. Um, you know, it would normally be a practice to very clearly share with the school the issues that we see so far in the hope that they could address all of them prior to the inspection and then uh, hopefully have a clean inspection or focus on those items that were unaddressed. Um, and here, that's been a, a stated request to Peoples, as it would be for any school since uh, the beginning of 2022. 
but it just, I, I don't see the school acting with urgency, consistency, or effectiveness. What reason was given for lingering or for, for this not, you know, not addressing our issues in a timely manner? Um, it would vary by item. Uh, I'm certain that the pandemic may have played a role. Um, other times, I, I'm really not certain. So for example, in disclosure situations, uh, information was provided to us as staff, and I certainly have less information about the records than the school does, but, but I was able to identify those students that weren't properly receiving disclosure and would be eligible for refunds. But yet at this time, the school says that's information they do not have, but I have identified it and have shared it with them. So um, it is confusing. Uh, is the Dean still on the phone? Can we give her an opportunity to address this? Um, or is this something that we're not? I prefer we continue complain. our discussion before we call the Dean. Okay, that's fine. Chair, you, you're, you're the boss. Sure. Continue. Continue discussion and not get the Dean. Yeah, and then we'll give her a chance to address all the issues. Sure. Um, so the last uh, item I didn't go up to it was that um, we thought appropriate that on the school's website that this current motion, however it's actually passed by the committee, actually be available on the website so that people who look at the website, students and others, can see what this committee's most recent motion was with respect to the probation. So those are the things I, I want to discuss in this motion, and of course I'm will, I welcome comments from many others. Back to Paul's comment earlier about uh, dates or times to have compliance. Um, I think there's a whole list of things that need to be complied with, and I, I don't have a problem with having dates if we can put a list together. Uh, for example, refunds to the students. Their website says refunds will be issued in 15 days, but they are telling us that they want 45 or 60 days, 90 days to issue refunds. Uh, maybe that's one thing that we say, refunds have to be issued within 15 days as set forth in your uh, website. Uh, the library doesn't exist as, as it should right now. That's another easy one we can say, that library has to be in existence in the next 30 days. Maybe that's what we do. And finally, the disclosures that aren't being made, we can say those have to be done with a certain date. We can add, maybe add others, uh, but those are at least three things. If you want dates, we can put in there. I'm not advocating them, I'm just pointing out those things. Those are my comments. No. I have some yes. observations. I just want to say that I, I concur with the issues that have been brought up around uh, noncompliance and not being able to meet deadlines and things like that. But I, I'm on the Ed Standards Committee, and I, I have read the uh, responses to the uh, inquiries that you know the, the committee or this committee has made. And I, I just need to say that I, they don't really give me uh, a lot of confidence that deadlines are going to be met uh, or, and I, I don't want to go out of the limb on this, I'm not sure how serious um, the school is about trying to meet these deadlines. So I'll just, there, there's a lot of issues, but I just wanted to focus uh, one in particular, wh which is the move. So we've been hearing about this move for a long time as something that would bring in enough resources that could sustain the school. But uh, in at least what I've read, I haven't seen any detail about even the building. What, what, is that build, what is that building selling for? What do they expect to get out of it? Who, who are the buyers? Is this an escrow or not? That's confusing to me. So, so today we hear that there is gonna be a sale, but it's getting cut real close to a deadline that has to meet our approval that teaching can be done in that site. So when I'm thinking about public protection, it's like, well, what about the students who are enrolled now or plan to enroll? Are they gonna have a place to be able to teach? And so the question of even um, remote uh, distance learning is still uh, questionable also at this point. So when the school says, you know, this is a team approach, at least uh, from what I've seen, it's more like this committee honestly having to pull teeth on getting answers to questions rather than sort of something that's collaborative and coming up with some deadlines and having those deadlines met. Mm -hmm. So my, my remarks have nothing to do with the school's reputation or its contrib contributions to the community. I think those are intact. 
what I'm worried about is the sustainability of the school going forward. And I think those things could damage the reputation of the school. Yeah, if I can make additional comments, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> what, I, what I do um, like, Natalie, is that you've taken very precise notes. You've kept us very abreast of the situation. Um, even going to the staff report, you're providing us updates as to what they're turning in, what they're not turning in, and what's being omitted. And so I think I said this in the last thing, I am concerned that there's omissions and things that haven't been done that we've given them a bit of a grace period on. Um, I think we've been very generous. And so I, I do wanna see more concrete uh, responses from them and timelines um, kind of uh, sharing the concerns of uh, Mr. Reyes, as he just presented. I, I think there is uh, an accountability for us to, to protect the public as well. And so in doing so, we, we definitely have to be a little bit more stringent. I understand these processes that they're doing and what they're asking for is kind of you know, a part of their, their process as well as to coming into compliance. Um, we just we just really have to be a little bit more focused on um, how do we uh, become more clear? I mean, uh, you know, just have more concrete deadlines um, and, and a better timeline. So we're not uh, on a, uh, what's it called? Each meeting, you know, we're hearing things. We need more time, we need more time. And um, and I understand that and, and I'm very um, accommodating to some of those requests, but at the end of the day, we have a job to do and that's to protect the public. So. Um, I definitely want to just uh, echo Mr. Reyes' comments. In thinking about deadlines, um, one way to handle it might be to key it to the uh, the probationary progress reports that are already being offered. So you might ask for completion by the July report or completion by the August report so that the school can very clearly put everything that it wants you to know all of the progress that it wants you to know inside of that report and provide staff with enough time. Um, the one exception I would have as to the August is that um, with respect to the, the motion to move the, the building, staff would just need more time. We have so little information in that major change that that's one that would be extremely important uh, to be in the July. And similarly, if they wanted to move to distance, also July. So that might be. Uh, one way. Anything else from anyone? So for today, we're adopting a motion um, approving the permanent change request. No. No. Denying no. it, right? And Thank then um, providing direction on their updated timeline. Well, one possible way might be to keep the motion as it is, and then to add an additional paragraph that indicates other than as noted above, all other recommendations are to be completed and documented mm -hmm. in the August 1 probation progress report. Not the July 1. Well, July 1 as noted. Uh, mm. So where it's noted in the motion right now, uh, staff would recommend that those July 1 dates are important. You might decide July 1 across the board, uh, or if you would like to give more time to be absolutely certain, you could say in an additional paragraph, except as noted above, all other outstanding requests should be documented as complete in the August 1 probationary progress report. Well, that the paragraph that I was asking for data on was the four point. Yeah, it is both general and speaking about compliance in general, but very specific with regard to the, the rule and then the, the BMP code. Um, so that, that could also be a place to, to put it. Is, is it, um, if we say, show us compliance with all the requirements, um, I don't know if that's possible for them to do, but, um, Natalie, would you say at this point that we have a pattern of increasing compliance even, or do we just have a pattern of um, requests, repeated requests for clarification and um, dialogue, but not much by way of um, actual compliance? More the latter. Um, the school has definitely updated their website. That's been progress. Um, they've added two paid positions, but as to the other recommendations, uh, we're seeing uh, progress, retraction, 
progress, questions, clarifications, extended deadlines without permission from the committee for those extended deadlines. So as far as actual progress completed, um, it's very limited. Okay, and so that, that doesn't seem to be the improving and uh, I forget the exact terms of our, our December mm -hmm. motion, but it talked about showing sustained compliance and coming into compliance. So um, that's at least that, I think that's an important message we need to deliver that that has to, be, we have to see market improvement uh, on that point for sure. Um, not sure how we say it. Um, I mean, one of the challenges is that the performance from this school is different than any other I've ever seen. And comparison is certainly not the means of regulation, but uh, for the school to make plans and find them ineffective or make plans and simply never implement them, um, just resulting in more delay and injury to students, it's, um, it's challenging to wrap your mind around. I mean, one option would be to propose an edited motion that we can present back to you after lunch. Uh, but I, I need clarification about the timing that you're thinking of um, so that I can effectuate what you are wanting. Well, I think uh, for many things, um, July 1 is next, a week from Saturday, a week from tomorrow, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably too soon. But for things like uh, moving the administrative office, um, it has to be that soon because we, we need time to process it and review it. Um, I mean, the library, if they, if they do decide and are given permission to become a distance learning school, then they don't have a physical library, right? They'll have a different kind of library, but they've never manifested an intent to permanently be a distance school. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so go back to what you were adding, Audrey. Um, all outstanding requests except this noted must be received by the August 1st, 2023 progress report. That was one of Natalie's suggestions. Uh, I'm suggestions. not sure that that's clear enough to them. Uh, uh, what is an, what is receiving us receiving an outstanding request? Um, Perhaps uh, rather than received, completed, and documented. And maybe in the August... Um, progress report. Um, Chair Kramer, would, would you find it important to place a deadline in the disclosure paragraph? That's something that you mentioned. Yeah, would this serve that? Or would that you, want serve? Go, you want me to edit um, this further move? Well, isn't that an outstanding request? Mm -hmm. So this would serve that purpose. This um, working with your intents, Jim. Yeah, I have a comment. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how much needs to be disclosed. I want to go back to the moving of the school and the property. I, I, I just, I'm not confident with the information that we have. So, you know, is this building being, who owns it? And who is it being sold to? I, I think that that can be disclosed just to give us a little bit more confidence. And what's the selling price? And we're cutting this deadline so close is, this, is the building that they're going into, do, do we have the address and is it move in ready? So there's, a, you know, you just, there's just a lot of detail in a kind of move like this, plus the expensive moving and all that stuff. I understand that the building that they're in is damaged and all that. So I, you know, I, I agree with this kind of deadline, but I'm just hoping that there's enough information that the, this, that information can be provided to you and, and is it being shared with you 
in in uh, in an adequate way that you can give back to this committee that we have confidence that yes okay we, they have met the deadline and we can go forward and, and we can approve uh, a motion and normally that information is included as a matter of course without staff even mentioning this is the first time that i've ever seen a request like that where it was not provided and it's the intent of the motion here to, to get at exactly some of those issues. Okay. And they can bring that motion to move any time now. They don't have to wait till August 1st. Correct. We, uh, we can get it filed on Monday. Yeah, it's it's proposed here to, to be received by July 1st. Uh, in particular, for staff to have enough time, but also if they continue their pattern of material omission, that there is time to, uh, to request and further information from them. Is now the appropriate time to move that this motion be uh, made? I just so, wanted to note that um, Alex Lawrence and Larry Kaplan, two members, are recused as they were in prior meetings from this, voting on this item. I just didn't did. mention it when they left. You suggested we just have some comment from the school? That's right. I don't object to that. And Jim, prior to um, recognizing the school again in that very last paragraph, where it says requests, perhaps we should say requests and compliance issues so that there is um, cl absolute clarity. Are we recognizing Dean Composo again? Uh, yeah, I think the chair should decide how much to limit her time, but yes. Um, other five minutes? I mean, this is very important to them and us, so I... Yeah. Uh, I think that's, um, can we say instead of compliance issues, um, maybe compliance actions or something like that? Um, yeah, I, I'm happy to give the Dean another five minutes to respond to this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hello, thank you so much. Um, can everybody hear me now? Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah, so, um, I have, um, I can definitely provide information, um, about, I, I know the, uh, some of the committee members were interested in the information in regards to the sale of the building. Um, so, um, I apologize. Um, I will going forward, I can provide more of those about the, uh, business side of the, um, of, of what's going on behind behind the scenes with the sale of the building um so okay so right now we have an offer from um walter j company for 2.9 million for the building and um we are about to enter um a 45 day uh due diligence period we're also purchasing this through a 1031 exchange in which um, we have already uh, through several, several visits to uh, buildings in um, nearby in the um, downtown LA area. We managed to find a building that is under a million dollars. It is on, um, let me give you the address. It is on Slauson in the um, Ladera Heights um, area of Los Angeles. Um, it is, I believe, 8452 Slauson. One moment, please. Uh, let me try to get that for you. And um, we we submitted an offer and uh, we are quite up the, uh, the uh, board president is quite optimistic that they will accept that offer. Um, the offer, um, PCL has placed an offer on the prospective property on 622. So that was just yesterday. And uh, within um, a few days, we will know if they accept that offer or not. Um, so when we filed the um, proposed motion of change, uh, that was in essence our delay. Um, uh, we did not have an address yet. We were hoping to get an address. But um, so that that was a, the delay in filing the proposed motion for for change. But um, I'm still not unclear as to whether I'm not unclear as to whether um, I can apply with that motion 
not having an address. So, um, and um, the the board is is the board at PCL is looking to um, they're 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 working and evaluating their you know their different options. And we were finally able to find this building here in Los Angeles. One of the criteria was that we um, stay pretty close to the PCL community. Um, it's it's we've been there for fifty years in the MacArthur Park area of Los Angeles. We identified some other buildings in the $2.2 million range, but that would not leave us too much of an access to build out our capacity. But with this building, um, it's under a million um, and um, it would leave us with with like a 1.75 in, in our budget to build out capacity. So um, we realize this is a need for PCL um, and um, that's that, that's what we're working on right now to to do that. Um, and in regards to, um, I apologize that I'm, I'm the one that writes the reports every, every month and in consultation with the board and, and with, um, the, um, the, you know, the, um, different, um, committees, but, um, I, I apologize for lack of, um, clarity, perhaps. I think there is a communication breakdown, um, uh, between, um, staff and PCL, and when I do ask for questions, I am truly um, hoping to get guidance and clarity from your staff member. So I'm not by any means being, you know, hiding anything immaterial. That's not my style. That's not how I've been. That that's not how I work. That's I, I've been before numerous um, uh, accreditation committees, and we're always transparent. But I feel like when I ask a question here, it's it's almost like um, it, it's 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 a negative thing, but I, I work in collaboration. Um, that's what we do in education. We, we we work in collaborations. We work in teams. We help each other out. And so, if I'm asking for clarification, it's just that clarification. Um, I apologize if some of the items weren't included. I gave uh, the best of my ability to include those items. And then when staff writes me an email and says, "Oh, you didn't include this," oh, I apologize. Let me let me fix that, remedy that, and then we give her the information. Sometimes that information is not ready of readily available to me, and I have to wait on on the committee, or I have to wait on on people to get that information to me. So um, I I just want to um, to to share that with the with the public and and the committee members. Thank you. That's that is time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would move that the motion be brought before the committee as presented. I'll second. Okay, as modified on the screen? As modified on the screen, yes. And there was Vince seconding? Yes. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Please, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, after uh, the response that we re received, I, I think it's um, something that we need to really identify if we do have any blind spots in our communication. Um, Natalie, not saying we do, because uh, obviously you've kept very great documentation, um, but but I would um, definitely uh, caution uh, PCL about moving forward. We really need to have a lot better um, responses and more thoroughness. I think for me, I, I don't feel comfortable uh, staying in this probation period without being in compliance um, for the benchmarks that we're setting, because uh, I know that at the end of the day, it, it impacts the, the client, the customer, um, the students that we serve. And so... Uh, for me, I, I just wanted to make sure that was on record because I know there was some commentary based on uh, the confusion or, or things of that sort. And, and I understand that. I think we've been very gracious in this process. And so um, in this motion, I, I definitely will support it. I just want to make sure uh, moving forward, it's clear that we we expect thoroughness. And that's and that's what um, I, I think is, is, is you know, our, our requirement as, as members of this committee. Thank you, uh, Kareem. And I want to confirm that we welcome questions from this school as well as any other. At this point, we are largely speaking to them in writing so that the committee can be fully apprised of all that communication. Um, but this, we have not only been open to questions, we have given courtesy reminders and courtesy identifiers where there were admissions, and we will continue to do so. Absolutely. My only advice, and thank you, uh, hopefully the Dean is still on the phone, and thank you, um, Dean Poso, for, for your comments. Uh, I think my only word of wisdom for you is, um, given your understanding now about all the materials that we are seeking in terms of compliance, 
you know, it is certainly advisable for you to take immediate action. I think the time has, has, has gone past us about questions. Um, if there are any additional questions that you have in terms of what materials you need to submit, you must do so, you know, as soon as possible. The time is running out, unfortunately. And, you know, as much as we want to help you, um, I, I think the committee has run out its patience, um, meaning well, I think the time has passed in terms of giving additional justifications about why certain materials have not been provided to us. Um, and, and so to that extent, you know, we hope that you will continue to do um, all you can and endeavor to provide us with every materials, whether it's good or bad, uh, so that we can evaluate the information before us. Again, at the end of the day, we only want to see what progress, if any, has been made. Right now, we just don't have the information, it sounds like, to make that decision. Um, so uh, on that basis, um, good luck to you. Okay, um, let's take the vote then. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Alex Chan? Jim Efting? Yes. Kareem Gingora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Larry Kaplan? Recused. Alex Lawrence? Recused. Esther Lynn? Bethany Peak? Ashley Silva Guzman? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Paul Kramer? Yes. With 10 yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. Okay, um, the promised lunch will occur. Um, we put the time to 110. Yeah, we put the time to 110. Are we ready? 110. What time are we coming back? 110. Does that 110. Sound right? Okay, that's fine.
Gavel, gavel, gavel. Watch this thing. Let's get a burst out. Yeah. Not the same. That doesn't have to stay okay. Um, yeah, way better. Thank you. So we're on the um, third item under Ed standards. Yep. Ed standards. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Was that what it was? It was. Nah, did you eat? Okay. Um, All right, back to Ed standards. So uh, the next one is for Pacific West College of Law action on the response to their notice of noncompliance and their request for voluntary termination of their registration. Jim and Natalie. There we go. Um, Devin, if you wouldn't mind just checking to see if D Dean O'Connell is available, I wouldn't, uh, he was not expected, but we'll check for an, in an abundance of caution. I don't see. Um, okay, thanks. And then Jim, I'll be happy to present when you direct. Okay, thanks. So in the case of Pacific West College of Law, the committee issued a notice of noncompliance at its last meeting and the school responded, I apologize. Um, the school responded and indicated that um, they are closing permanently. Um, so they have already done so and the motion contemplates acceptance of the closure. Um, excuse me. Uh, it contemplates acceptance of the closure uh, and that would terminate the school's ability to teach the JD program as well as its prior LLM and master's degree programs. Um, it's also worthwhile for the committee to note that uh, it had a very small student body, uh, but right now, if uh, the students have not paid in full, the school is not releasing its official transcripts to the students, which impacts their ability to transfer. Uh, this is not a state bar rule, but it does relate to civil code 1788.91 which prevents the school from using a transcript as a debt collection practice. And so the committee may wish to make a, a statement reminding the school of their obligation under California law. And that, is that all a part of the motion? Yes, it is. Um, anything to add, Jim? Uh, is that it, Natalie? That's all. Can we see the motion then? Yeah. Thanks. Somebody wish to make this motion? Okay, Mr. Efting, second? Second. Mr. Torres, um, any further discussion? We take the vote. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. Dr. Cal? Yes. Alex Chan? Jim Efting? Yes. Kareem Gangora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Larry Kaplan? Yes. Alex Lawrence? Yes. Esther Lynn? Bethany Peak? Ashley Silva Guzman? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Paul Kramer? Yes. With 12 yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. Thank you. Um, final item uh, relates to um, Western Sierra Law School action on their inspection report and a major change request to deliver classes via physical classroom and distance delivery but uh, remain in the fixed facility category um, jim and natalie sure thank you uh, devin would you mind just checking for dean schoonover and registrar schoonover i do expect that they will uh, be here to make a public comment they're raising their hand Okay, great. Thank you. So um, after the staff presentation, we'll, we'll recognize uh, Dina Registrar Schoonover. Okay, uh, so Western Sierra Law School has been in operation since 1979. Uh, there was an ownership change um, near the beginning of the pandemic, and the, the Schoonovers are now uh, in the leadership of the school. It's owned by a, an entity in which they are um, interest holders. Uh, the school was inspected for the first time since the ownership. Um, it was inspected at the time when the uh, emergency distance waivers for fixed facility schools were in place and the school had just completed um, an approved move by the committee 
Um, and it's normal that after a move, there would be a video call or something like that. You saw today in the administrative update, something like that for Irvine College of Law. Uh, there wasn't a separate uh, meeting set for this school because the inspection was upcoming. Um, as would not be surprising for a new school under new ownership, especially in this case where they had extensive business experience, but not necessarily educational experience, um, you do see a large number of recommendations. Uh, but the consultant recommended continuation of registration um, under the theory that uh, it could be quickly resolved. Um, and hopefully uh, many of those have. Uh, some others are, are discussed in the motion today. Uh, so the compromise, even in spite of a large number of recommendations, many of which are important, was to set an inspection at, at two years, which is pretty common for a change of ownership. Um, and to have the inspection in what would have been 2023, but at this point in time, what staff would recommend is to adjust that to allow them to give one more current written update and do an inspection in 2024. Um, in addition, during the waiting period, they filed a, a major change request to stay in the fixed facility category, um, but to have the flexibility to use distance learning as a delivery tool. This is something that's available to accredited schools, along with the other responsibilities of being an accredited school, but um, not to uh, distant, not to fixed facility unaccredited schools. The law school uh, disagrees with that interpretation, and in their motion, um, you can see their argument that they would find the um, interactive distance class to be the same type of delivery as fixed facility at the current level of technology. Uh, but state bar rules, underlying statute, and state bar practice um, are built on distance learning being represented properly um, versus fixed facility learning. Um, and in fact, if you look in the distance learning rules and guidelines, it does talk specifically about interactive classes and requires at least 135 hours of those interactive classes for the distance learning category. Um, staff does not see the need to upend the statutory construction and interpretation, the rules and guidelines, and the um, eligibility uh, at this time. If the committee is interested in a change, it could be reviewed and pursued and discussed with the legislature as part of, are we still up? Um, as part of the rules revision, but under the current rules, um, staff recommendation is um, a denial. And uh, that's all I have. Anything, Jim? Okay, um, do we have the school's representative available? And we'll allow. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, and we'll give you five minutes to uh, uh, provide us comment and whatever else you wanna say. Thank you, I'll read a statement given the limited time. My first point, Western Sierra Law School's registration should be approved with the next inspection to occur in fall of 2026 or five years. State Bar staff propose renewal, but with inspection to occur in spring of next year, which is too soon. As grounds, the State Bar staff cite inexperience of new ownership, low bar pass rates, and alleged large number of inspection report recommended actions. As to the inexperience, the law school continues to retain and the prior faculty and advising staff having collectively over 100 years of legal education experience. Any lack of experience of owners is negated by retention of experienced faculty and advisors. NPR, the minimum bar pass rates are going up substantially since new owners have assumed authority of the law school, evidencing significant competence. The law school has received no complaints. About the NPR, the law school's cumulative five-year NPR is 50%. More importantly, the law school's three-year cumulative bar pass rate, since I have assumed role as dean, is 62.5%. Regarding the number of inspection report recommended actions, of the 30 recommended actions, none are of material compliance. All are based on recommendations for further compliance. What is further compliance? A review suggests recommendations presented are not related to the unaccredited rules and guidelines, but rather are based on the rules and guidelines for accredited law schools. In some, they don't apply to Western Sierra. They should all be removed from the report. The majority of actions are policy, publication, and website related. They are de minimis in nature. Notwithstanding, the law school has adopted and implemented each of them without contest and has supplied documents to the state bar staff indicating the same. Many of the items are factually incorrect. 
moot or the cited rule is misapplied. We emphasize that throughout the inspection report, it is indicated that the law school is in compliance or at least minimal compliance, and that all of these suggested actions are to place the school in what's called further compliance. The CBE is respectfully requested to renew the law school's registration for five years. My second point, a major change should properly be denied because one is unnecessary under the rules and guidelines. In the alternative though, at the CBE's discretion, the major change may be considered and authorized. Here are the facts. Western Sierra is a registered fixed facility law school and wishes to continue as such. Western Sierra returned to the physical classroom nearly a year ago for classes in fall of 2022. Western Sierra conducts its instruction principally in the physical classroom facilities. The instructor is present in the physical classroom. A majority of students attend the physical classroom. Classroom instruction is also broadcast over a synchronous online classroom extension via Zoom Room technology. Additionally, our library contains hundreds of physical volumes and is located in the physical facilities. These are the facts. Western Sierra intends to continue as it has been operating. We respectfully ask the committee to indicate that no major change is necessary under the rules given the foregoing set of facts and the authority that I will cite in a moment. The authority. A fixed facility law school is defined in rule 4.204J3 as a law school that conducts its instruction principally in physical classroom facilities. Further, guideline 1.5 states law schools in each category may provide educational programming in either or both of the other two categories. The law school is expressly authorized to blend delivery formats under the rules and guidelines. State bar staff have indicated that distance law schools have a higher hour requirement than physical fixed facility schools. This is false and misleading. Additionally, this argument fails because our program requires about 1,200 hours per year of instruction when considering out of class preparation, substantially exceeding the 864 required hours for distance schools. In closing, arguably one of the top educational institutions in the world, Harvard University, from which I received a graduate degree in biotechnology also utilizes technology to extend learning from a physical classroom facility to a synchronous online classroom extension. I believe that most institutions now do the same. Even this very meeting we're in is being conducted principally in physical facilities and extended via a synchronous online extension. This is undeniably the way of the future. There is compelling reason and rational basis for providing such a mode of instruction whether it is to accommodate students in need or to mitigate the spread of infectious diseases. Most importantly, the rules and guidelines expressly permit blended formats. In the alternative, with respect to a major change, the CBE has precedent as previously approving similar blended formats for schools such as the California Desert Trial Academy of Law and Humphreys School of Law. Thank you. I'm happy to address any questions. Would it be helpful to have a staff response? Okay, um, so as to a couple of things, uh, with respect to the recommendations regarding the inspection, many of them were administrative in nature, um, and the school has asserted that it has um, addressed them, and one of the suggestions is to ask for the, the documentation of that, uh, but certain others are, are important. Uh, so, for example, at the time of the inspection, there were unproctored exams, potentially using questions that were readily available online. Um, in addition, it is true that uh, the cumulative pass rates that were discussed um, are, are very strong at this point. Uh, but in addition, uh, so is the attrition. Uh, looking at the number of freshmen who start as 1Ls reaching the fourth year, and so by the time of the fourth year, um, really, I want to say that there have been approximately four graduates um, since the school took over uh, several years ago. Um, so I think that those things need to be considered in concert. Um, and part of the recommendation for this time period is to make sure that those 30 recommendations are complete um, and that the school is continuing to function well and strong, not only for those few that make it to the fourth year, but so that all have a reasonable interpretation. Um, also, uh, this meeting is being conducted in person and also um, online, and we publicize it to the public as a teleconference. That's how it's noted here, um, and that's how we treat the other schools as well. Uh, the 
Dean also identified two schools. Uh, one is Humphreys. Humphreys is an accredited school and uh, does have permission to have a mixed modality offering uh, based on the rules and responsibilities of being a, an unaccredited school. Um, California Desert Trial Academy does have a, a limited waiver, uh, but it is more properly within guideline 1.15 in which the instruction is principally uh, by classroom means. In the case of uh, California Desert, that has a large advanced fixed facility that has three classrooms specifically created to look like different types of uh, courtrooms, an appellate courtroom, a state courtroom, a federal courtroom. They have eight hour in-person enrichment programs and very few people um, do attend that school any portion online. Those that do may, do may have an occasional hour or two during the week, um, but their program is very solidly in a strong fixed facility uh, with occasional online attendance. Uh, by comparison, this school uh, did move during a time um, at the pandemic where uh, with an emergency waiver, they were not required to meet on site. And so they did the move, not knowing that the pandemic would unfold as it is. Um, but at this point, uh, the consultant observed that the school was in fact a law business and a storage room. Um, we have asked for photographs. The school has indicated that the law business has vacated. Uh, we learned that only recently and, and no photos have been received. Um, in terms of teaching online, the school represented that about 25% of the 13 total student body have been attending in person and that many students have moved away out of commuting distance from the area. Um, so given that, uh, in terms of being transparent to the public, uh, it seems that the distance format is what's described and so that's what is um, leading the staff recommendation. Thank you. Yes, and that's extended one year beyond what the consultant suggested, yes. Yes. If somebody's speaking, we can't hear it. Yeah, Please I think there's the mic. the mic, yeah. Turn it. Okay, sorry. So let's start again. So the first part of it is that the consultant suggested that the inspection be in 2023 and you propose 2024. That's the correct. School's asking for 2026. Jim, you need to speak. Sorry. If you want to look at her, put the mic between you. Okay. Right. Aim it at her. <laughs> so again, um, the consultant suggested 23, 2023. Uh, staff suggested 2024. The school's asking for 2026. That's correct. And the reason you want 2024 is because of things that have happened in the past that you want. You don't want to wait till 2026 to make sure they've been all resolved. That's correct, but I think 2024 is more appropriate to allow the school to give a full um, a full update with documented evidentiary support prior to the inspection. Rather so, than doing it this year. Correct. And the second point is that at this stage, given the rules that we have to work within, you believe the school needs to be a fixed facility. Uh, if they want to do something else, they have to apply and change their application of some sort? Uh, the instruction that they're doing right now that they've indicated they will continue to do uh, does not appear to be consistent with approval for a fixed facility. Uh, so staff recommendation is to encourage them as, as we have been over a period of time to, uh, to file a request to operate in the distance category. They've declined to do so. So if I understand correctly, what I believe the school to be saying is uh, the staff recommendation is to deny the uh, operation as they request to do it. I've heard them say that they don't believe any motion is necessary and they will continue to operate in that manner, even if the committee denies this motion now. Um, so that is, uh, that's my understanding. But it's, it's staff's understanding that they're, what they're doing now, they're not committed to do next year. Correct. And by passing this motion, we're just reaffirming our position. Correct. And then, so if they continue to do that, it might become the subject of a, um, a notice of non-compliance. Correct. That's all I have to say. 
Okay, thanks. Any other questions or comments? There being none, I will move that this motion has uh, presented. Yeah, let's get that up. And... So I would make the motion as, as on the screen at this time. James Efton. Second. Okay, no further discussion. Let's take a vote. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Dr. Cow? Yes. Alex Chan? Yes. Jim Epstein? Yes. Preem Gangora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Larry Kaplan? Yes. Alex Lawrence? Yes. Esther Lynn? Yes. Bethany Peak? Ashley Silva Guzman? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Paul Kramer? Yes. With 13 yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. Okay, thank you. Um, next is our long awaited report. Report on the unauthorized practice of law, Mr. Lane. Thank you. Uh, with your permission, I'm going to stand up in front of everybody. Um, use the mic, though. Yep. I'm going to use a lapel mic. I sit at my desk and talk into Zoom enough. Um, I figure I might as well do this when I have a chance. Excellent. Can everybody hear me? Great. Um, so my name is David Lane. I am the attorney for the Moral Character Unit at the State Bar of California. And I'm here to give the committee members a broad overview of the topic of the unauthorized practice of law. Many of you, if not most, have heard me talk about this before. Uh, Ms. Silva Guzman may have not. Um, and it's always good to get a refresher even for me. Uh, the reason I'm talking about this is because it is an issue that comes up in the context of processing moral character applications, not infrequently, either because attorneys from other jurisdictions come to California, jump the gun, and start engaging in the practice of law before obtaining authorization, or sometimes uh, law school graduates, people who pass the bar exam, also get ahead of themselves and start uh, putting themselves, holding themselves out as being authorized to practice law before they are. Um, so this is something we frequently see in the moral character context. Um, what I'm going to do is first uh, just give you a quick overview of the few rules that generally are the primary rules that prohibit the unauthorized practice of law in California. I'll call it UPL for short. Um, and then I will talk about uh, the several step analysis that we go through when we think we might see an applicant who's engaged in UPL, how we make that determination. Um, and then talk to you a little bit about some of the common contexts in which we see it. So first, uh, the statutes, there are a couple of statutes, the primary statutes that prohibit UPL in California, they're found in the Business and Professions Code. 6125 and 6126. Um, section 6125 is succinct, it's one sentence. No person shall practice law in California unless the person is an active licensee of the state bar. Seems fairly straightforward. You might think we could stop there. Uh, but if you think like a lawyer, you can spot at least three ambiguities in that sentence. Um, first, what does it mean to practice law? Second, what does it mean to be in California, which is not such a straightforward question in the era of remote work? And then finally, uh, what are the parameters around licensure um, that authorize the practice of law in California? Well, section 6126 is a bit longer. It, there are several paragraphs there um, as opposed to one sentence, and it elaborates on 6125 in a few important ways. Uh, two of which address the ambiguities uh, we just talked about. It doesn't address the issue of what in California means, but I'll talk about that in a minute. We get that from case law. So 6126, first of all, it clarifies that practicing law includes not only engaging in activities that comprise legal practice, 
which I'll get into in a minute. Uh, but it also uh, includes holding yourself out improperly as being authorized to practice law. This means that if you graduate from law school and you think that your JD uh, means you're an attorney and you start, you put attorney on LinkedIn or elsewhere, um, you have engaged in the unauthorized practice of law, arguably. Um, second, 6126 uh, acknowledges, 6125 sort of suggests with it the active licensee language that you have to be fully licensed by the state bar to practice law in California. Not so. Um, there are rules of court and rules of the state bar um, that authorize the practice of law. I'll discuss, some of those have been discussed earlier today in this meeting, um, things like registered in-house counsel, uh, but I'll get into that a little bit next. Um, and then finally, 6126 uh, explicitly states that it is a crime, it is a misdemeanor to engage in UPL in California. In fact, if an attorney a California attorney is disbarred and then engages in UPL, that uh, falls into the category of what prosecutors call in California a wobbler. It can be meaning it can be charged as a felony or a misdemeanor. Um, somebody can actually face prison time theoretically uh, for engaging in the unauthorized practice of law. Now, I'll just say quickly, in the moral character context, it's not often that we encounter instances of applicants who with bad faith explicitly commit fraud walk into court and pretend they're attorneys when they're not um, sometimes it's inadvertent sometimes it's based on a misunderstanding of a rule often it has to do with holding themselves out rather than actually engaging in the practice of law um, but the egregious circumstances do happen occasionally uh, the most notable recent uh, time that happened was a couple years ago when a non-attorney represented felony uh, defendants in criminal court in Marin County, um, and she did not have a law license, and she was, in fact, uh, prosecuted federally and sentenced to 18 months in federal prison. Um, interestingly, the, uh, the feds did not prosecute her under the statutes that prohibit the practice of law. She ended up being prosecuted for wire fraud had to do with actually paying the dues of a otherwise inactive attorney whose identity she had assumed. Uh, and then she also uh, fraudulently obtained a COVID loan. In any case, the underlying conduct um, that was really egregious was going into court and pretending she was an attorney. Okay, so that's the statutes. Next is rule 5.5 of the rules of professional conduct. This is the UPL rule. Um, there are other statutes and other rules that touch on UPL, but these are the primary ones. 5.5 um, has a couple of sections. The first one we're not that concerned about in the moral character context because it applies to California attorneys, that is people who have already gone through the moral character process. So not people whose moral character applications we are processing, but I'll just say, it prohibits California attorneys from engaging in UPL or knowingly assisting someone else uh, in UPL in another jurisdiction. Um, the second provision of 5.5 is something we do run into in the moral character context. The first section, uh, and it, it'll, because it applies to non-California attorneys. Um, and so, yes, the California rules of professional conduct govern the conduct not only of California attorneys, but of non-California attorneys who are practicing law improperly or holding themselves out as being authorized to practice law in California. Those attorneys are subject to the disciplinary authority of the state bar. Um, so the first subsection of 5.5, the second section of 5.5, uh, prohibits non-California attorneys from unlawfully establishing or maintaining a resident office or other systematic or continuous presence in California for the practice of law. Um, the obvious example is some somebody's uh, license in Ohio, they move to California, they hang a shingle, they start a law practice. Uh, that violates that, that rule. Um, there are more subtle circumstances which fall into grayer areas such as 
let's say uh, the Ohio attorney works a law firm that has an office in Ohio and in California. They transfer to the California office, but they just continue to represent Ohio clients uh, whom they represented in the Ohio office. Have they uh, established or maintained a resident office or other systematic or continuous presence in California for the practice of law? Uh, it can get tricky. It depends on a lot of little variables. Um, another thing to note about this rule is it does not prohibit a non-California attorney from moving to California and continuing to practice remotely in the jurisdiction in which they are licensed. Uh, so the Ohio attorney moves to California, isn't working at a law firm, doesn't advertise him or herself as an attorney, simply works remotely in Ohio from California, representing Ohio clients. That person has established and is maintaining a resident office or other systematic or continuous presence in California, but not for the practice of law. Um, they moved to California to be a resident, to live there, and essentially, uh, without getting in, going too far down the rabbit hole on this issue, if that non-California attorney as as effectively maintains an invisible professional presence in California, but continues to practice law in his or her home jurisdiction, um, they're not going to be in violation of this law. Uh, the second uh, subsection there, holding out, it prohibits holding out to the public that the attorney is authorized to practice law in California. I already explained um, that that is something that is considered UPL in California um, and perhaps every other jurisdiction. So those are the main rules that prohibit UPL. 6125 and 6126 of the BMP code and rule 5.5 of the rules of professional conduct. Those are the rules we primarily lean on when we are doing UPL analysis in the moral character context. Okay, so what is our process? We see an applicant, we think there may be some indicators that he or she is engaging in UPL. Well, first we have to decide what are they doing? What are the activities they're engaging in that might constitute UPL? Uh, that means we have to talk a little bit about what legal practice is. Um, second, we're going to see if they're holding themselves out as being authorized to practice law. Um, I mentioned the example of a law student who graduates, starts calling herself a lawyer or an attorney before she's sworn in, licensed. Um, that can become an issue. Uh, next, the in California issue that I keep referring to, uh, we have to decide whether this is a remote work situation um, that allows the person to literally practice law while they're physically in California, but they're not considered to be practicing law in California. So that's an issue that can get tricky. Uh, and then finally, um, I mentioned that 6126 uh, acknowledges that one doesn't need full legal licensure in California to be authorized to practice law. Earlier in the meeting, um, the committee discussed several rules relevant in this context, registered in-house counsel, registered legal aid attorneys, uh, foreign legal consultants, um, and I'll give you the list of those uh, in a couple of slides. So we asked the question, okay, this person is seeking licensure, they're going through the moral character process, but do they perhaps already, are they already authorized to practice law in California? Those are the steps. Let's talk about each one quickly. Um, activities that com comprise legal practice. This is uh, defined by case law. California Supreme Court cases, uh, courts of appeal cases. Generally, we're talking about three categories of activities. Two of them are pretty black and white. The third is not. So the first one is appearing in court. Um, usually it's pretty clear when somebody has appeared in court or for another adjudicatory body. Uh, there are transcripts, there are minute orders, there are recordings, uh, there are documentary records of the proceedings. Um, second, uh, preparing contracts or other legal documents by which uh, legal rights are secured. Um, quick aside here, none of this applies to somebody doing any of this on behalf of themselves. That's why we have pro se litigants, pro per litigants. You can represent yourself. You can uh, write your own contract. 
you can, if the court allows you to um, represent yourself in a civil or a criminal case, you're not engaging in UPL. So whenever I'm talking about these things, you can always insert, you know, a, a, a parenthetical on behalf of someone else. Um, so preparing legal documents, contracts, other transactional documents, uh, pleadings, things of that nature. So the third category is the most sort of vague category. That's providing legal advice and counsel. Um, and it's sort of intuitively the case that sometimes it can be tricky what exactly constitutes giving someone legal advice and counsel. Um, the courts have spoken a little bit about it, the fact that the overall definition of law practice is sort of intentionally broad um, because legal practice is broad. It entails a lot of activities and it's hard to nail down exactly what's going on without knowing the, the true specifics of any given case. But broadly speaking, those are the three things that constitute the practice of law. Appearing in court, preparing legal documents, providing legal advice. Um, okay, so what about holding oneself out? Um, I talked already a little bit about this. Usually in the moral character context, we're going to see this. Someone's gonna use a title in a legal setting that connotes licensure, lawyer, attorney, associate, esquire, counsel, of counsel, partner. Um, there's some exceptions here. Accounting firms, for example, often use the title associate and obviously people could be a partner of any number of businesses, but in the legal context, associate means lawyer uh, most of the time, uh, as does partner. And so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say here, there are, there's bad information out there. You can find internet sites, you can find little legal blogs um, that will say, when you graduate from law school, you're a lawyer, but then you don't get to call yourself attorney until you're sworn in. Not so. Uh, that's incorrect advice. That's not true. Um, and it, not infrequently, we'll have recent law, law school grads who will bring to us that defense of their use of the word lawyer. Um, and we will steer them in the right direction without providing legal advice and try to educate them. Um, what they're doing is they may be looking at Bob's legal blog um, dot com, but they're ignoring way more credible and numerous sources to the contrary. The ABA has a big web page that says, what is a lawyer? And it says, a lawyer is an attorney. Uh, the Business and Professions Code uses the two terms interchangeably. Uh, the dictionary, Webster's, uh, defines lawyer and attorney as being synonymous. Um, there are a number of other examples. Uh, so one arguably almost has to willfully ignore these credible and numerous sources in order to rely on uh, less credible sources for that argument. Anyway, I just pointed out because it comes up occasionally. Uh, when we do talks at law schools to uh, grad, you know, people that are gonna graduate soon, I usually try to point this out to them. Um, just wait until you're sworn in. Uh, Out-of-state attorneys, uh, often, like I said, come to California, they want to get registered as in-house counsel. Maybe they're working for a California corporation. Maybe they want to get full licensure. They plan on permanently staying in California. Um, they jump the gun. They, so in their, uh, let's say in their email signature block or on business cards, they started working at a firm or at a corporation. They identify themselves as an attorney. Well, I can't tell them they're not an attorney, right? Uh, they are an attorney. They're just licensed in another jurisdiction. However, the rule prohibits one from holding oneself out as being authorized to practice law in California without being authorized. Um, and arguably, and there are, again, edge cases here. Uh, there are variables that need to be considered, but it helps if an attorney is from out of state and they have attorney in their email signature a lot of attorneys will put a little asterisk or a little parenthetical that says licensed in Ohio, not licensed in California. That eliminates the possibility that the reader is going to infer that they are in fact licensed in California. Um, so that those are two ways in the moral character context that we see the issue of holding oneself out come up. Okay, what does in California mean? Uh, it doesn't mean in California physically. 
uh, in the era of remote work, which was going on long before COVID, this was addressed in a Supreme Court case as Burr Brower is the seminal case in 1998. Uh, we did have computers in 1998 uh, and people were able to work remotely because of remote work. Um, this means that an out-of-state attorney working in their home jurisdiction remotely from California, the Ohio attorney I mentioned earlier, is not necessarily considered to be practicing law in California for the purpose of the UPL rules. Similarly, a California attorney who is living in another state and is practicing law remotely in California from the other state um, is considered to be practicing law in California and is subject to all of the rules and statutes uh, and other regulatory provisions that govern their conduct. Um, which actually reach outside the state lines in any case. Um, but suffice to say, the remote work can go both ways. Um, the Supreme Court discussed this, like I said, the Burr Brower case is the big case. And it's it can be a tricky question. You can have a New York licensed attorney living in California, working on a legal matter that's governed by Indiana law for a client who's living in Florida. Um, you know, the mind start, it, it's a tangled web that gets woven sometimes and it can be difficult to figure out, well, where is this person practicing law when they work on that case? And this might be a good time to mention, it's always important in the moral character context, I believe, to remember what we are doing. And it helps to remember what we're not doing. We are not, in enforcement. We are not the Office of Chief Trial Counsel at the State Bar. We are not a prosecutor's office deciding whether to charge somebody with UPL. We are trying to determine whether someone has the requisite moral character to become an attorney in California. So if there's an extremely complicated case, the applicant appears to have acted in good faith and come to a good faith conclusion that they thought they were authorized to practice in the way they were because of some remote work situation or something like that. And it takes me five hours of legal research to really try to make a dispositive decision about technically what they were doing. It might be worth considering in a case like that, whether even if ultimately it looks like they may have been engaged in UPL, whether that conduct reflects poorly on their moral character or whether it does not. That is a distinct question from simply deciding whether they engaged in UPL. Again, what we're trying to determine is a moral character um, determination, not a technical dispositive decision about whether they were violating one of these rules. Um, let me just say quickly on that last side, in Burr Brower, in those complicated situations, the Supreme Court there are a lot of variables. Where you are is one of them. What law is governing the matter is another one. You know, did you engage in sufficient activities in the state to mean you were in California? But in my mind, in Burr Brower, the primary concern of the court, which makes sense, is were you providing the services on behalf of a California client? That makes sense because what is the state bar's uh, mission, at least part of the mission, to protect the public, the public of California. Um, and so when there's one of those complex remote work situations, um, it's important to look at who the legal services are being provided to. Okay, short of full licensure, this is a list of various ways in which someone can be authorized to practice law in California without being fully licensed. Again, some of this was uh, discussed earlier today. The parenthetical MJP there refers to the multi-jurisdictional practice program at the state bar, registered military spouse attorneys, registered legal service, aid services attorneys, and registered in-house counsel are part of that program. Um, I'm not going to get into the minutia of who's eligible for what here. That's not what this talk is about. Suffice to say, there, there are a bunch of categories here of folks who are authorized to practice law without full licensure military counsel, um, you know, JAG lawyers, uh, registered uh, spouses who are married to members of the military who moved to California, 
certified law students refers to the practical training of law students program that State Bar runs. Often that's three L's, people in their third year of law school, they're in a clinic. They get actually hands-on experience working on a real legal case under the supervision of a California attorney. Out-of-state arbitration council, um, registered foreign legal consultants, they are folks from foreign jurisdictions who can get registered with State Bar and give advice on the foreign law uh, from the jurisdiction in which they are uh, licensed. Registered legal aid services attorneys, in-house counsel, litigating attorney, and non-litigating transactional attorneys temporarily in California for the practice of law. Also, in certain circumstances, if they meet eligibility criteria, they're authorized to practice law. Um, out of all of these, the one we see most frequently in the moral character context is registered in-house counsel. People who move from other states, they work for a big California corporation or a small one, and they delay actually registering as in-house counsel. Once they register, they, they submit a, a MJP application, it gets approved. They are authorized to practice while their moral character application is pending, but they need to get that registered status first. Um, okay, so next, um, yeah, I wanted to mention there are other ways to be authorized to practice law in California when you have nothing to do with the State Bar of California, and that is in federal jurisdictions. Um, the State Bar of California does not regulate who is authorized to practice law in federal venues, district courts, courts of appeals, immigration courts, bankruptcy courts, the USPTO. That's not to say that the conduct of attorneys in those courts is out of the reach of the State Bar of California. First of all, if a California attorney commits misconduct in a federal venue, that attorney can be disciplined by the State Bar. Um, it's just that the state bar doesn't decide who's authorized to practice in these venues. Um, and, and it's always important to remember, uh, just as conduct in an entirely different jurisdiction of a non-attorney, let's say a criminal matter they had in Florida, in the moral character process is going to be relevant, so is any misconduct they, that occurred in federal court. It's, it's not a get out of jail free card. It doesn't mean we're not going to look at that stuff, uh, but they don't, be, they don't have to be licensed by the state bar. Um, okay, I think we're at our final slide, I believe. And I just wanted to mention a few of the common contexts in which it can get a little tricky in the moral character context sometimes. Deciding whether UPL has occurred, and uh, we see these things frequently, so they're worth mentioning for that reason, too. First one is paralegals and law clerks. Paralegals are governed by sections of the Business and Professions Code. They have to meet certain eligibility requirements. They have to engage in certain activities, have sufficient supervision. We might see paralegals who are becoming attorneys now. They overreach. You know, maybe they're drafting legal documents not under the supervision of an attorney. That paralegal may have engaged in UPL. Law clerks, um, I have a, a bullet point there, unlicensed associates. Usually, uh, you know, law firms hire people straight out of law school before they are licensed. Um, they want to grab who they think the good lawyers are going to be before those people have become lawyers. Um, and so the, um, the new associates, the unlicensed associates, they might be uh, going through the moral character process. They might take a couple times to pass the bar exam. They can work at the firm, and often they're referred to as law clerks. That's much safer than calling them associates because, as I said before, the word associate at a law firm is generally synonymous with attorney. Then you run the risk of holding yourself out as being authorized to practice law. Um, Many law firms are very aware of this issue. They're good about it. They call them law clerks. They don't issue them business cards until they are fully licensed, et cetera. But that's an issue we run into. Legal document assistance, similarly governed by sections in the Business and Professions Code. Um, they're permitted to essentially act as scriveners, um, a word I might not have known until law school. They can help people fill out documents, essentially, uh, with information that the client gives them. Um, compliance officers is a tricky area. Um, 
Compliance officers are folks, um, often non-attorneys, who work at big institutions, universities, state universities, private universities, corporations, and their job generally is to ensure that the entity for which they work stays in compliance with either internal policies and rules. Um, that's not so tricky. That doesn't appear to be the practice of law because it, it's they're not giving legal advice necessarily. But a lot of compliance officers are there to ensure that the entity for which they work stays in compliance with federal and state regulations and laws. And so it can be, you know, the entire compliance industry is sort of pushes right up against the unauthorized practice of law. Um, and there's some gray area there. I mean, there are a lot of non-attorney professionals who ensure compliance with rules and regulations that arguably are not practicing law. You might think of human resources folks, um, uh, people like that, uh, you know, supervisors in various roles. Um, the details become important in those cases, uh, looking at exactly what the person's doing, whether they're um, exercising independent legal judgment. In-house counsel, I discuss Document review attorneys um, are often attorneys from other jurisdictions. They get hired through, hired through staffing agencies or sometimes directly by law firms. They're usually going through bankers boxes um, that are being prepared for discovery in a big civil case looking for the term widget three. And then every time they see it, they flag it. Um, and the courts have decided that that is not engaging in the practice of law if what they're doing is sufficiently limited by instructions from a licensed attorney who told them to look for the term widget three, they're not exercising a lot of uh, independent judgment. Those people can sometimes begin to cross the line into UPL. So that's something that we see sometimes. Similarly, contract attorneys or contract specialists, sometimes they're called contract officers. These are folks who work at usually large institutions. Their sole job is to uh, draft and uh, finalize, negotiate contracts. And I, I use the term draft cautiously because the thing that saves them from preparing legal documents, because a contract is a legal document that secures somebody else's legal rights and duties, is if their uh, activities are sufficiently limited by instructions from a licensed attorney. Often they're working with contract templates. Um, they really don't they're not allowed to go outside that template. Their role is more like something like that of a paralegal. And I'm not gonna pretend I have all the answers here where those bright lines are. Um, luckily, I don't have to, because like I said, in the moral character context, we're not trying to ultimately, in some of these cases, we don't have to reach a dispositive answer. Did they technically violate the UPL rules? It helps if we can do that. But if we have trouble deciding, then it's probably worth considering whether we want to hold it against the applicant um, who may not have been in a position uh, to, to make the call. And they may have felt like they engage in good faith um, and due diligence. Uh, and so I'm going to stop there. That's intended to be a broad overview of UPL. Um, if you, there are a lot of details, but I'm not going to put you to sleep. I could talk for hours about this stuff. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Robert, Brody. Yes, microphone. Yeah. Oh, thanks. I have two quick questions for you, David, and thank you for an awesome presentation. We've all been wondering about that for a long time, so it was great to hear. Here's my questions. When you make a when you have a moral character application where there's an issue where you are convinced there was unauthorized practice of law, do you refer that applicant to chief trial counsel for investigation and possible sometimes, action? Sometimes. So often it's the case that, let's say we have a law student who uses the title attorney on his or her LinkedIn page. Um, we are, you know, I may advise the moral character investigator to write to that applicant and say, please review your LinkedIn page and explain how you are in compliance with the laws that prohibit improperly holding yourself out as licensed to practice law in California. They will read that letter. 
they will write back in an hour, I have edited my LinkedIn page, I have taken down the word attorney, now I just say JD or law graduate. We're not gonna refer that person to OCTC, the Office of Chief Trial Counsel, um, most likely because they're now in compliance. Um, it doesn't usually seem in a case like that, like somebody was engaging in egregiously fraudulent behavior. However, um, let's say we have somebody who comes from out of state, they're licensed in Texas, they wanna become registered in-house counsel in California, um, but it turns out under the current rules, they, that, well, they still live in Texas, okay? But they they got a job as in-house counsel at a California company. Under the current rules, um, which may be subject to change as we discussed earlier today, you have to reside in California in order to become in-house counsel. Sometimes those applicants will say, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, in that case, hey, I just wanna withdraw my moral character application, I'm good. We have reason to believe that they may just continue doing their job in California and engaging in UPL by practicing as unregistered in-house counsel. And in a case like that, we may refer it to the Office of Chief Trial Counsel. To, so the answer to your question is, it depends on the individual circumstances, whether we think there is improper conduct that is ongoing is a huge factor. Oh, okay, thanks. Here, here's my, my other question, and thank you for, the, for that answer. If you have an attorney, uh, whose practice is limited to immigration and they are licensed in Mexico as an attorney or Nevada or Arizona, and they hold themselves out on their business cards, on their signs, attorney at law and on their stationery? Yes, oh. is the answer in short. Um, these are legal questions and I can always think of little variables and details that would make the question a little more ambiguous, but I want to answer what I think you're asking. You know, if somebody is strictly an immigration attorney in California and they're authorized to practice before the immigration courts, um, they can advertise themselves as an immigration attorney. And that is not something in the moral character context um, that is going to raise much of a red flag for us. Um, if we think an immigration attorney is overreaching. And I've seen cases like this where they advertise themselves as, you know, you go to their website and it says immigration, criminal, civil, traffic. Um, then we might have an issue. Um, but it sounds like what you're asking is they're, they're, they're doing everything in compliance with the rules under the immigration court's rules. Yes, they can identify themselves as immigration attorneys. Yep. If there are no other questions, uh, you can always uh, I always welcome the members. You can hit me up with questions anytime if this issue ever comes up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, next is the uh, director's report. Oh. Oh, yeah. Amy, we're starting with the work plan. Do you want me to share it? Is it on? There's like a slide. Is this on? Okay, yeah, you got yeah, it. Alex, sorry. All right, so um, as promised, we are bringing the work plans back. This is the approved work plan for the CBE that was approved at the May meeting. Um, or I'm sorry, April meeting. This is a work plan that includes the one-time ass assignments uh, the annual um, assignments that uh, the committee takes on and the additional assignments that uh, the CBE prioritized at that uh, April meeting. And so uh, what we noted at the previous meetings was that we were going to bring this document back in the event that there were any questions or um, concerns about uh, the each of these items. Uh, each assignment or each task has been uh, uh, the deadlines and whether it needs to go to the board has been revised. So I'm bringing this just um, in the event that anybody had questions. Like I said, I think uh, what we've decided to do uh, for the work plan in, in the future is to bring it to the committee each time there was updates 
for any questions, but uh, this is not a new document. If anything, it's a comprehensive of everything that everybody, we all agreed on at the last meeting and then um, has revisions in the deadlines and the next steps. So are there any questions? Any questions or comments, anyone? I have one. Um, okay. I was listening to the Board of Trustees meeting in May mm -hmm. um, about the Blue Ribbon Commission. That was my specific, what drove me there. Um, and I forget who, and I didn't write down the exact quote, but somebody made a comment to the effect that we, that the bar might be looking into whether we should continue to regulate law schools. Um, was that simply a, a my mishearing somebody or somebody making an offhand con or is, is there anything like that in the works? Um, whether we should regulate altogether, regulate law schools altogether, well, or, Paul? Yeah, I mean, maybe I, I, what I assumed was, you know, uh, delegate that role to some other entity. Um, but it, the bar would get out of the business of regulating that. I don't recall that um, comment. Um, I, I attended the BRC yeah. session. And as far I as you know, nobody's. No, I don't. Okay. That is not um, on the plans. If anything, uh, one of the things that's added on here is the uh, revisions to the uh, unaccredited registered law school rules that, that right. are still ongoing. So, um, no, I don't. I don't think okay. that's the case. Because that was it was a surprise to me that somebody might be thinking about that in there. I guess I'm trying to nip that in the bud or, or know that it's going on. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Amy. Next is the applications. Um, let me share. Yep. Um, so just a reminder, and I've sent, I think, a couple emails to this effect, but we're coming up on a deadline if you want to apply for the chair and vice chair positions next year, a resume, letter of interest to the Supreme Court, an electronic copy to the court and the state bar board liaison. I sent you those email addresses over email. Let me know if you need those again. Um, Tara's going to go, not your mic, right? <laughs> go through a couple um, data points about we had a deadline related to provisionally licensed lawyers at the end of May. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So just as a reminder, um, initially the provisional licensure program was supposed to terminate at the end of last year, but the court decided to extend it. So for the 2020 graduates, they had until May 31st, 2023 of this year to meet um, all of the requirements, except for passing the bar exam to remain in the program until December, 2025. So we currently still have 127 active provisionally licensed lawyers in that initial pathway. So the 2020 grads, the December order also allowed the pathway to licensure to reopen. So folks in that cohort they have until the end of this year to make to apply, and then they also can stay in that program until December 2025. We currently have 115 of those um, PLLs, and then we have 19 of them that have completed their requirements or just waiting to be sworn in. And we had 576 folks that have been admitted through the Pathway to Licensure program after completing their 300 hours and the additional requirements. So, just a quick update. But were there any questions? What, can you speak into the mic? I do not for this meeting, but we could bring that back at the, for the next one. Yes, thank you. All right, I'm gonna give a Blue Ribbon Commission update. Um, Paul just alluded to. Uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission's uh, report returned from public comment. There was a meeting, a final meeting of the commission on April 26, and some changes were made after uh, public comment. And then that report was brought to the Board of um, Trustees at their May 19th meeting. So these were uh, the recommendations, some of them amended um, um, in the report after public comment. So to develop a a California developed exam covering both federal law and California law. There was um, after public comment, we made um, the commission made sure to mention that um, the exam will include federal law where appropriate. Uh, the CAPA recommended topics, so those eight um, topics from the California Attorney Practice Analysis, 
um, plus um, adding back in professional responsibility. Again, after public comment on the report, um, the commission added professional responsibility into the topic. So that's nine topics um, recommended. The CAPA recommended skills. Uh, focus on the future bar exam on skills and application versus rote memorization, uh, that the state bar and subject matter experts will be tasked with exam development, and then a recommendation on reciprocity for attorneys from other states, regardless of educational background, to cover here in California our different pathways uh, to attorney licensure like law office study and our California accredited and registered law schools. So that was um, from the report. So the Board of Trustees. Uh, approved the final report and recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission, um, directed staff to transmit that report to the Supreme Court. Um, what was not moved forward by the Blue Ribbon Commission, there was no um, consensus on any bar exam alternative. And so the board um, had a, a lengthy discussion about the inability to review any proposals related to bar exam alternatives. So this was a um, further motion put forward by the board to direct staff to ask the Blue Ribbon Commission members who indicated support for a bar exam alternative to develop a proposal for this pathway, drawing on the Blue Ribbon Commission guiding principles, deliberations and materials with input from experts and other stakeholders they identify to be submitted to the board for consideration at its July or September 2023 meeting. That will now be the September meeting. There's been a timeline, timeline developed with this um, working group of uh, Blue Ribbon Commission members who supported a bar exam alternative. They are meeting um, and developing a proposal. Um, the proposal will be drafted. Um, staff will be able to make comments and members of the Blue Ribbon Commission um, who are were not in support of the bar exam alternative will also be able to make comments. That would be at the board meeting. They will be able to make comments before the September board meeting. To staff. Staff, yes. They'll the the report in draft form will be given to Blue Ribbon Commission members who aren't part of this blue uh, working group and to staff. Okay, but this this really is doesn't sound like a particularly public process. Um, to an exchange of emails, and then ultimately, will the first opportunity for those of us who are interested to provide comments be at the uh, September board meeting? And effectively. Yeah, so the um, members of the public or, or others who were not members of the Blue Ribbon Commission will have the opportunity at the September board meeting. I, I do want to be clear, the, um, the, board, the board passed forward all of the recommendations that the, that the Blue Ribbon Commission made. Um, they did not make a recommendation one way or the other on whether, whether the court should consider alternative testing or, or alternative tools to to establish minimum competence. Um, the board itself has previously expressed an interest in that. And when the board recommended to the court in November, uh, December, that they, um, that they ex uh, um, extend the provisional licensure program, they specifically directed staff to indicate to the court that the board was, I think the phrase they used was putting their thumb on the scale of uh, the option that favored uh, turning the um, remaining provisional licensees into a um, into a pilot project, essentially for uh, for a for supervised practice as a pathway to licensure. So what the board basically said is, we understand that the that the Blue Ribbon Commission did not make a recommendation on this. Um, we would like to consider possibly we the board would like to consider possibly passing a recommendation on to. The Supreme Court. And so, hey, we happen to have this group of people here who got a lot of information on the alternative pathway through this Blue Ribbon Commission process. We know they've expressed interest in this. So we would like them, um, if they're willing, to give us the board a recommendation. The board will consider that recommendation. If that's something they agree with, then they may choose to pass that on to the, um, to the Supreme Court. Um, so I just wanted to be clear when we talk about them as Blue Ribbon Commission members, right? They're doing this as, as people who happen to have a lot of information about this that they gleaned while they were on the Blue Ribbon Commission. Um, but because of their connection to the commission um, and because we know the court values the opinion of everybody who was on the commission, that is why we are also, why that group will be circulating to the other members, the other former members of the commission, the proposal 
for them to comment on. And then those comments, along with the, st the staff comments, um, will be presented by that working group to the board um, at the September meeting. Yeah, I listened to the meeting when I, once I heard about this, um, just because I was curious how this came about. Um, it's fair to say that in November, staff proposed in their in their um, staff report to the board um, this pilot program. Whereas this time, it seems to have come from the members themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that they didn't really. They seem to want to affect. <clears throat> I don't think they use the term stack the deck, but they, a couple of them basically said, let's talk to the people who are in favor of this. And um, I, I applaud staff for now, after the fact, kind of trying to include the other members of the Blue Ribbon Commission, because I don't think the, the board members themselves did that. Um, uh, I would ask though, if this thing is available before our August meeting, if it can be presented, put on our agenda, um, and present it to us so we may, if we have um, the consensus committee uh, opinion of this committee of bar examiners, we may vote upon that and then transmit that to the board for their consideration as well. So I would suggest even if you, if you think the report's going to be ready only a few days before our meeting, preemptively put a discussion of it on our agenda so that we are able to do that. Okay. Yeah, and obviously there were two members yep. of the CBE in their capacity as CBE members who were who formed the group of, of former Blue Ribbon Commission members who would be receiving a copy of this for comment. It makes sense that part of the way that they would formulate any comment would be reaching out to the CBE. Right, but um, this is this has never been in my mind a situation where we just send them out to do what they think is best on our behalf without. Uh, uh, giving us the opportunity to provide our feedback to them so they can do that more effectively on our behalf. Yeah, and I'm also Alex. still in the dark as far as, you know, what's going on at, at this current moment. Uh, I don't know who these members are. I personally have no clue. I've not been told or informed about whether there have been meetings among those members. Um, I have no information. So I'm in the dark. So you would appreciate our... Um our advice yeah and i don't know what initiatives if any have been taken what meetings have been taken what proposals have been uh put on the table um and and so the fact of the matter is if if, if these proposals are to be um, uh discussed at the september meeting i would have hoped that we other members of the blue commission would have the opportunity to look at these proposal and to provide comments and feedback well, I think they're saying that you will you will yes you okay will. And, and that's something they added on right, to but this is the first time me hearing it yeah, I, I I I have received no email from anyone, any staff about when we would expect to receive the proposal, whether and how much time we would have to provide feedback. No such information had been given to any of the members. Am I correct, or did I miss those emails? I, I sent to the Blue Ribbon Commission an update about um, about this. But I think okay. I, maybe I did bounce back. I forwarded it back to you. I think anyway. I'm trying to remember from from emailing you recently. Um, but I did update the members about this board action. Um, yeah, I'm aware of this action now, but in terms of the timeline. Oh, in terms of the timeline. Yeah, yes. in terms of going, I mean, now that the, 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 the action is now on the table, but in terms of timeline, what's going to happen now that the action has been resolved? Yeah, so what we can certainly do is uh, reach, out to, uh, reach out to the group and suggest that they send an email to the former members of the Blue Ribbon Commission and give them the timeline of when they can expect to receive um, receive the advanced version of the recommendations for comments, so you're fully in the loop on that. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think it sounds like part of your concern is just to make sure we have the proposal um, uh, before going to the board meeting. We get to discuss and then to provide comment and feedback before it actually is on you know before the board. I think that's your yeah. position, right, Paul? Yeah, I'm just yeah, working yeah. as hard as I can to get us as much of a voice in this process as we can obtain. Agreed and understood. Oh, okay. This is Ravi. Maybe this question is for Alex. What was the recommendation that I guess has gone to the Supreme Court regarding reciprocity? We are now you have the board. Yep. The yeah, commission. we're recommending reciprocity. Yeah, yeah. but but there, the there, there there's some strings attached. Um, I can show that full recommendation. Yeah, Let me exactly. do that because I have that. 
Yeah, in terms of number of years, I don't think that was mentioned either. Yeah, there's some strings attached and oh. Audrey will be able to show. I don't think it differed much from what we've been told in the past about <laughs> regarding the bar exam. This was the full recommendation, Robbie. But did you have the major um, points that the blue ribbon recommended regarding the bar exam? Yes, I should have that too. I can. Oh, there, yeah. Okay. Wow, it, that's pretty big news. I mean, oh, yes. was he asking about reciprocity? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, but one aspect of this is we're saying to other states that if you won't take our uh, California accredited and registered school graduates, then we won't take yours, and presumably they won't let our all of our other California attorney members have reciprocity either. So we're um, this is purely Paul's opinion, but we're holding the vast majority of California attorneys' ability to have reciprocity hostage to this attempt to force other states to um, to accept those other graduates. But I think they all will, because most of those states already have reciprocity with every other state. We were the holdout, not the other 45 states. So I... I, I'm not even sure that that's a real thing that you're talking about, because they already do it with everybody else, just not with us. Not with us. So this is big news. No, but most states, um, with the exception, well, there's there's maybe three or four states now, I forget the exact number, will accept our graduates from our California accredited, the non-ABA schools, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but most states won't. Uh -huh. But... Um, what they're suggesting here is that we use our leverage, access for their attorneys to our state to require them to take all of our graduates, ABA or not, um, or you know the deal's off. Which uh, I, I personally filed comments with the commission saying that shouldn't do that, but. Yeah, the concern is just making sure it's fair and equitable. I mean, we have a large chunk of non-ABA schools in California, mm -hmm. credit and uncredited schools, and we can't just leave them hanging, right? We, I mean, and, and funny thing is a lot of states just don't recognize non-ABA schools, and, and especially in California. And so we can't, you know, pass something that just leave them out and dry. That That's really, that's against the principles. Um, yeah, I mean, so that, that, that's what you're seeing. Yeah, there's, being, there's two sides to that coin. I, I don't think the number of, uh, Non-ABA graduates in California even is significant. It's uh, not a very big number compared to the ABA school lawyers. Anyway, that's just a observation. Uh, really quickly, um, so this is of course a recommendation to the Supreme Court. Uh, is there any timeline of the Supreme Court decision? Timeline. Um, so the um, so the recommendation is formally um, being transmitted to the court. Um, hopefully today or Monday, um, and then uh, um, we are, um, it is possible that the court uh, will be able to consider it um, in July, uh, mid, -ju mid to late July when they have their administrative conference. Um, if not, it will be considered in, in August. Um, one of the, um, uh, we stressed, uh, the, the letter when it's final, will stress the importance of um, moving quickly on this. Um, because uh, the, we have a statute which requires um, at least two years' notice if there is a change in um, a change in the exam that would require a significant change in in the how you prepare um, mm -hmm. for the exam and how you prepare a test. Um, and there is a limited time during which we would have access to the MBE. Um, and so if you sort of do the math on that, um, it, it cuts into the ability to develop a California specific exam. So we've stressed to the court the, um, the importance of, uh, of their um, direction to us as quickly as they can. Okay, thank you. Does that also relate to the potential loss of the MBE? Right, because they have okay. um, given us a time frame for when they will no longer provide it. Okay. Um, All right. Okay. The, Question for Donna, is there going to be a public comment period um, if and when there's a proposal by those members who are tasked to provide the substance of this pathway? Or is it going to be sort of a straight shot to, uh, to the Board of Trustees? 
Uh, so at this point, there's just it's anticipated the the board of trustees asked them to present it to them on uh, uh, July or September. As Audrey said, um, it will be September, not July. Um, and so there is not a public comment anticipated before that. As you know, there was significant public comment on the Blue Ribbon Commission report itself. Right. And so the board has the input from the public on the concept of an alternative pathway, um, those who supported it, those who did not support it. Um, and so uh, and, and so, I don't think that, that, that they thought that additional public comment would help inform that, that discussion. All right, moving on to admission. admissions fees. Um, I'll try to make this right. Um, so I, um, so at this point, we wanted to circle back with you all on uh, the proposed increases in fees to support the work of the Office of Admissions. Um, since we last presented to you on this topic, uh, we put the proposed fees out for uh, public comment. We presented the two options uh, that were discussed with you, um, and we presented uh, we presented those options and the themes from the public comment on those options to the board um, at their May meeting, and uh, we received direction from the board on how to proceed, which I'll be going getting going into in just a moment. Uh, but one of the things, maybe less for the members of the committee than for the members of the public listening that I wanted to start with was a quick reminder of why we're proposing fee increases in the first place. Um, and, um, and it gets to the fact that most of the fees have not been increased for uh, in more than five years, while at the same time, the costs to operate all of the programs and services that are offered by the Office of Admissions, things such as the bar exam and the first year law students exam, those costs have increased. So, so fees haven't increased, costs have increased. Um, as the committee is well aware, the end result of, um, of that is that we have a structural, structural deficit in the admissions fund. Um, and it's a deficit that we cannot sustain. Uh, we will be running out of money. The current 2023 budget projects a seven, that there, there are seven million dollars more in expenditures than in anticipated revenue in 2023. At the end of this calendar year, the remaining fund balance is projected to be just $4 million. Um, in other words, without a combination of fee increases and cost reductions, the fund, the admissions fund is not uh, sufficiently solvent to be able to support operations through the end of 2023. Um, so with that, we proposed a series of fee increases. Um, as you'll recall, um, with the assistance of the committee of bar examiners and a working group, particular, in particular, I believe it was uh, volunteers Larry Kaplan and Paul Kramer, I believe, and uh, Ashley Guzman, who uh, worked directly with staff on this. And we developed two options for increasing most of the fees. The first option was the break-even approach, and that was the approach that was strongly favored by the Committee of Bar Examiners. This approach was designed to ensure that the revenue received was sufficient to fully meet the operational cost of running the program. So this was full cost recovery. The sec second option was more modest. Um, in most instances, the second option capped any increases for students or non-attorneys at 10%. Um, it, did not, it did not represent full cost recovery. Um, uh, both models reflected uh, significant increases for those who were generally assumed to be in a better position to absorb fee increases, i.e. assumed to be the attorney population in many instances, um, that they could absorb, uh, absorb them. So they had more significant increases that would have been um, under both of the options would have, would have hit that population. Um, but despite the, um, the virtues of the, in the policy behind the second option, um, capping costs for the students, it resulted in a continuing four and a half million dollar deficit. Um, so the CBE therefore put its support behind option one. Next slide. Uh, presented with the facts and figures, the um, as well as the themes from the public comment, the Board of Trustees was guided in the end by its fiduciary obligations and the financial realities that we face. And they largely agreed with the recommendations of this committee. The board directed staff to follow up with an approach 
that largely adopted the option that resulted in full cost recovery, but providing for exceptions in some instances where it was appropriate, where the increase on the, non, on the student population, for example, would be so extreme. So, um, so we've come up, and we'll get there in just a minute, um, we've come up with a, a revised option um, that, we would like to, that we wanted to present to you. Um, but following our presentation to you today, uh, the plan is to go out for another 30-day uh, public comment period with this, with this now sort of final version. Um, and then we'll take the final version to the board in September um, with, uh, with the public comment. Um, and the intention is that the fee increase would generally take effect the start of 2024. Right, this is a way to get through 2024, so we need to realize the revenue in 2024. The reason I bring this up is that what this means, in order to realize the increases for the full year when it comes to increases on the bar exam, right, we have a bar exam that's scheduled for February 2024, um, but registration opens for that exam in October. And so our plan will be when, when, the, um, when the fee proposal goes out for public comment, we will also concurrently provide broad notice on our website through direct email communications and otherwise um, of the proposed amount um, to that population that is likely to be um, registering for the February 2024 exam to the extent that they are starting to save up money um, for registration when it opens in October. We don't want to give them notice at the end of September that of what the, the new fee is. So we're going to be giving them the notice now. Seeing that we really got direction from the board um, about, the, about the direction they wanted us to move in, we feel very comfortable, right? We are not committing that this is the exact amount that the board will adopt in September. We certainly can't commit to that, but we want them to have a, a, a pretty good sense of where we think that the board is, is going on this. So that is our plan when we go out for public comment to also notice those um, who in our system we can tell are, are likely to be slated for the February 24 exam, as well as posting notice on the website. So with that, I'd like to show you the um, current proposal that we've got. Oh, um, wait, before that, <laughs> we have a different slide. Um, so um, so the, um, the, proposed, the proposal that, that you'll be looking at, unlike option one, which was full cost recovery, or option two, which had a four and a half million dollar deficit as a result, um, projected ex the projected expenditures with this proposal would still exceed projected revenues by just over a million dollars. Um, so, um, so after after I present the um, the fee increases that we're proposing, um, I will open that up to questions. But then we also want to talk about the part that we've been working on concurrently, which are cost reductions. Right? Because we still have this million dollar deficit, we need to we need to have re have uh, reductions in costs in order to continue to operate. We have talked at a high level in past meetings about looking at reducing the um, number of bar exam sites, considering whether we can go remote one day, considering use of state bar offices instead of some hotel sites where we can. Um, and so we've got some models um, that we've looked at for cost reductions that focus on the bar exam. Um, focusing there because it is our largest single expenditure, and that would therefore be the logical place in order to find some, some cost reduction. So with that, um, I did also present these same slides to the um, committee of um, the state bar accredited and registered schools. <laughs> Suddenly the acronym went out of my head. I presented the, sl the same slides to them on Wednesday and um, got some suggestions uh, from the members of that committee for, um, for uh, when we get to the, the law school regulation fees, um, got some suggestions for better visual depictions, which um, might give more information to the public. Um, we'll be making those changes when we go out for public comment. Um, right now, what you have in front of you are those same slides that we presented um, to CS bars. Um, so, um, so we've got three slides here in a row um, that show the current proposal. For reference, uh, the prior two options are included. Uh, I'm not planning on going through these fees one by one, uh, but generally you'll see for non-attorneys increases that are higher than was proposed with option two, 
but not quite as high as were proposed in option had been proposed in option one. So for example, for those of you who are squinting at the screen, um, the proposal that was put out for public comment raised the non-attorney fee for the bar exam from the current $677 to either $745 for option two or $878 for option one. This version puts the fee at $850, so close to option one, but not quite there. Um, similarly, for the first year exam, the options previously circulated increased the fee from $624 that's currently charged to either $685 under option two or $1,850 under option one. This version sets the cost at $850, the same level as the bar exam uh, is set at. Next slide. So this slide includes the, um, the MJP fees um, as circulated for public comment, as presented to the CBE. Uh, when last we presented these fees, there was only one option. Again, this, is, this, um, this option was built on the assumption that those applying for this program likely had a greater ability to absorb the increases than, uh, than students or non, the non-attorney population. So we only went out for a public comment with one option. Um, and so this proposal just, just mirrors that same option. Next. Um, and here we have the proposed revisions to the law school fees. Um, for the annual report and the inspection. In the public comments, uh, we certainly heard from schools, um, as we did today, um, indicating that they would need to pass the increases on to students in order to be able to absorb such significant increases. Um, and so as a result, we put a column on this slide, which looks at, um, we looked at each school's tuition and fees, we looked at each school's enrollment numbers, um, as they reported to us in their 2022 annual report um, to determine what the per student impact would be if the entirety of the increase did have to be passed along to the students. So starting with the CALS, um, you'll see that the proposal here adopts option one, um, which is a significant sort of raw dollar increase if you look at it um, from $2,170 to $22,900, right? That's a Right, takes your breath away when, when you first look at it. Um, and, and we understand that. Um, but as, uh, as Mr. Efting was pointing out earlier, um, we also know that, that we, need, we need to be able to cover our costs um, in order to be able to continue to provide our services. So we, we took a look at that, at that number, and this is sort of how we arrived at, were we gonna stick with option one? Were we gonna go closer to option two? How are we gonna do this? But we took a look at it, and um, and we what we saw was that between the increase both to the fees in the annual report as well as the inspection fees, um, on average for the CALS, it nets out to just over two hundred and sixty dollars per student each year. Um, and so we just we thought that that um, that analysis would be helpful in sort of really understanding the the impact. Um, and for that, that average $260 per student each year, um, for eight of the CALS, that amount is actually less than $100 per student per year. Um, for another four of the CALS, it is less than that average amount. Um, as you heard earlier today, obviously, the way the math works is that a smaller school is going to have a, a, a larger impact. Um, and so, um, and so there are, there are a few schools that do in fact have, uh, have obviously, that's how we get to the average, but have a, a, a higher impact, whether it be $571, I believe it, it is, um, for the, um, the school that we spoke to earlier, we heard from earlier today. Um, so there are schools that, that would have a per student impact that is higher, but on average for all the CALS, it's $260. As to the registered schools, you'll see that the proposal moves a lot closer to the previous option one. Um, but remains uh, remains not quite at that amount. Um, the result is an average per student impact, again, of both the report and the inspection fee increases of just under $300 per student per year, um, with an even split of half of the registered schools below that number and half above. With the exception of two schools 
if the increases two of those registered schools if the increases are passed along to this have to be passed along entirely to the students this represents less than a one percent increase in tuition and fees um, and for some of those significantly less a one percent increase so again just a, another way to take a look at these numbers and put them in context um, and so, as I said uh, before we got into these, the end result of this is uh, still a deficit of over a million dollars. Um, and so that's why, after your questions, we'll turn to looking at um, the cost reduction models, which, and I just want to tee up um, again, um, we'll have, we'll introduce that item today. Obviously, we'd like to take some input from the committee um, in, in case there are additional models, things that we need to explore or delve into a little bit more before the committee next meets next week to give us a their direction on these models um and uh, and then we will come back for a meeting on june 28th um we'll be meeting remotely um to to get the direction of the committee okay so first questions about um the the fee proposals any cream uh, thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, so this is a recommendation we're sending on to the Board of Trustees at this point. Um, so at this point, we're yes. Yeah, so we are um, we're sharing this information with you. Um, this committee had already um, already yep. provided a recommendation to go with option one, um, and so um, so I will obviously I will take whatever we get from public comment. And any input I hear from you today mm, back okay. to the board when we report. Yeah, because I remember we went through this pretty intentionally. We had Excel sheet open and we were yeah. doing math on the fly. And so uh, I guess from my perspective, I've been on this committee for about five years. We've done a lot of cost reduction, a lot of intentional work on reducing our uh, footprint. And so uh, to see it still in a deficit is kind of disheartening because um, we're all feeling the cuts you know, across the board. Um, so I, at what point is um, the state bar going to be in a position to talk to the legislature and see what opportunity there is there? Because my concern overall is that our opportunity schools are going to slowly but surely no longer be opportunity schools and be you know, pretty expensive uh, to the point that uh, but people are going to be disinterested in jumping into the field. And so um, I understand the cost of new business has risen. I, I totally understand that. I just wonder how much do we pass on to the consumer or, or ultimately, which are our, our students um, that, you know, attend law schools. Um, and at what point do we, you know, find, be more creative in our, in our methods um, and identify how do we close these deficits without passing on the cost. So that that's kind of where my mindset is going. Cause I mean, throughout my tenure here, we've cut in every direction. We've made a lot of intentional work and, and it's great work. I'm not, speaking about it negatively, I'm just speaking about it openly, like from my perspective, we shouldn't be in a deficit. We should be able to retain the current fees, but I but I understand um, if we're in a position to make cuts or pass on costs, we should be very mindful of the way we do that to the, to the schools. And I hear you with the 1%, but for me, I have three kids. 1% of anything impacts my grocery budget, impacts my, uh, you know, when, when I used to have gas. And so those things, from a community like mine, those are real impacts. And, and I totally understand um, a lot of the times we talk percentages, but at the end of the day, these are, these are, and I've talked about this pretty often that if it's one to two people, I, I believe in the power of one. I think one person could really do a big impact in the community. Um, when I had the opportunity to go to Cal Northern, I learned about the individual who's a first undocumented attorney. And so what happens if he's unable to pay those fees? What happens if that story is never to be told? What happens to that community? And so that's kind of way I'm looking at it. I'm not trying to, you know, be oppositional, but I do want to be uh, very uh, bring a different perspective to it. Yeah, absolutely, Kareem. And, and don't forget, it was it was the staff proposal that was option two the last time. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we were trying to be very cognizant of the impact on the students. Um, the board um, and CBE both looked at the financial realities. Um, as to the first part of your question, though. And um, we have started having some conversations, starting with legislative staff. Um, there, there is at least one state that we know of um, where there is part of the the annual assessment on it, on licensed attorneys in that state includes some some amount that would that ultimately funds the admissions department. 
Um, it's a, I don't think it's totally funding mission to cost it's a contribution to it. Um, but we've started those discussions and we've let them know not only is the state bars general fund um, having uh, some, some significant budget challenges and needing a fee increase for that, but that we need to be to start having conversations with them about the about admissions. They know that we are, we've talked to them about the fact that we are looking at increasing fees and some of them significantly, and that we want to explore with them opportunities like we know exists in this one other state or other other ways. So it is absolutely something that we are committed to to looking at. And um, and you know, I might take an opportunity to pick your brain a little bit and come up with some additional. Alex? Um, Donna, for those fees, <laughs> um, for those fees that are directly borne by the applicants, um, and I think you already answered this, uh, my question is, could they be offset by an increase in lawyer licensing fees? This sounds like this is something that is under consideration, uh, which begs the question, if so, how much? Um, as a caveat, I am certainly aware that the state bar um, may ask the Supreme Court you know, for 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 us for an assessment of these fees, if the legislature does not approve the fee increase, so I'm unaware of that. Um, so I think again, my question it's it's really whether we have done a diligence to sort of look at the numbers and say, well, you know, if these fees that are directly borne by applicants could be offset by lawyers, licensed lawyers in California, how much are we looking at? Do you know? Um, I I don't. I mean, I certainly haven't done the math. We can look. We you know we have. Uh, if if you give me two minutes when I'm not on a microphone, I can actually do the rough math of of you know a, a generally a ten dollar fee increase on licensed attorneys gives you about two million dollars. So it'd be twenty five million if you wanted to go with option two, which had a four and a half million dollar deduction, right? So four and a half million dollar deficit. So that that would be sort of very back of the envelope kind of math. Sure. Um, we are. Um, We, I, I would think it highly unlikely that we would be able to do anything like that in such a way that would allow us to offset these increases before 2024. Yeah. In order to increase fees and get the revenue that we need in 2024, yeah. this is this is the only way that that we know how to do. And the legislature also has to approve it too. It's not just us. I mean, we could do whatever we want, but if the legislature doesn't right. approve that's it, that's my then... point. The legislature would would absolutely need to authorize that. Okay. So obviously, at the, at the beginning of this meeting, you know, we've heard from schools that are just, you know, asking us to find other ways to find additional sources of revenues. Um, do we know if there are additional uh, um, uh, resources where we can get money, or are those resources pretty limited? Um, so, so I mean, we have ex we have talked about things like, and we get a loan from the state bars state bars general fund reserve. That reserve is going to be gone by the end of 2024 as well. Um, so, so there that although there may legally be an option to do that, um, realistically there is an option to do that. And so that's why we're looking at the cost reductions for the bar exam as a way to take at least a very small amount of pain out of the fee increase that we need to do. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, um, so no, we didn't agendize this to, to be anything more than a report. So there's there's no recommendation that we take action. Um, with regard to the cost saving measures, uh, I first want to thank staff for um, thinking about us um, and making it possible for us to hear this information. Um, today, I think we just need to hear what they're talking about. Um, and uh, and not not discuss it. It's not really up for discussion because it wasn't agendized. Uh, that's the reason why we have a meeting next week. But if you have a question that you want them to address next week, um, and you can state it today, I think that helps them mm -hmm. prepare so that we can have a better discussion next week. Um, but again, I want to thank them for spotting that we were perhaps going to be left out of the loop on this very important discussion that directly relates to one of our core responsibilities and making it possible for us to receive the information and then provide any recommendation that we want to provide to the board 
next week before they consider these measures at their July meeting. So go ahead. All right. So our cost reduction strategies target uh, around the largest exam cost drivers. So that includes facilities and proctors and a few factors that guided this exploration. And Amy, the could you that, speak up just a little sure. bit? Sure. Um, so a few factors that guided this exploration and the models that I'll be describing are one, ensuring that the plans do not impact the population uh, with testing accommodations. Uh, two, that we create uh, the least amount of burden to examinees. And uh, three, that um, this is just information that we gathered uh, after each of our remote exams. We surveyed applicants and, um, and in that survey uh, learned that uh, the preference for testing between remote and in-person for a lot of the applicants, the majority of applicants is remote testing. Um, examinees also who sat for the in-person exam uh, were surveyed as well and expressed and reported the same preference for a remote exam. So some of these factors guided some of the um, information contained in these models. So uh, can we go to the next screen? Um, so here are the strategies that uh, we'll be describing uh, that's consolidating the uh, exam sites to fewer sites, uh, delivering the essays and PT potentially remotely, and then using state bar offices, both in San Francisco and in Los Angeles for remote, for testing accommodation applicants. All right, so here are uh, the different models and I'll describe all four. So the first is no change and that is administering the exam as it is today. So all components would be administered in person uh, mm -hmm. at multiple sites um, across the state. Uh, if we, and we, uh, as you, Recall in February, we have anywhere between, I think, 10 and 12 sites. And in July, it's, I think, 12 to 16, 14 to 16 sites across the state at the cost of, as you see here, about $5.6 million and, and some. Um, this next model uh, is the um, limiting that to six sites. These six sites include three, what we're calling super sites. And those are sites that uh, can uh, accommodate about between 1,100 and 1,400 examinees and three T, uh, TA sites. Uh, what this does is limit uh, the number of sites, and there would be no sites in Sacramento, Oakland, or San Diego if we use super sites. And the estimated savings for that, and again, this is all in person, is about $855,000, roughly. The next uh, model here is a combination of the same six sites with a one day remote exam. So that would, uh, as you may recall, the MBE, uh, the National Conference of Bar Examiners requires that we uh, provide or administer the MB as an in-person exam. So that would be administered in person and we would have the essays and PT administered remotely. But, um, as, as we did with the remote exams in 2021 and 2022, um, anybody who does, has a testing accommodation that is not uh, compatible with remote proctoring would have to test it on, in, in person, um, as well as um, applicants who require a testing space and need have extenuating circumstances that uh, require that they test in person, we would accommodate those applicants. And again, using the Six test sites, uh, it leaves no sites in Sacramento, Oakland, or San Diego. And that estimated savings is uh, about $1.5 million. Now, this last model is similar to this one, except that we would be using state bar offices uh, for testing accommodation applicants. So uh, it involves the MBE in person and the um, essays and PT um, to be administered remotely. Uh, once more, no sites in Sacramento, Oakland, or San Diego. And that estimated uh, savings is roughly um, $1,800. I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> $1.8 million. Um, so one thing I wanted to mention about that is mention the fact that we're trying to reduce the burden on applicants as much as possible. And so in order to do uh, to reduce that burden of taking a remote exam one day, um, and immediately needing to travel to take the in-person bar exam, uh, we may need to explore uh, the idea of separating these two exams um, 
And so they're held over different periods, perhaps like a, a week apart potentially. And that would allow applicants with extra time to finish testing their components before needing to travel or being required uh, to do so. Um, so again, these four models uh, target our biggest exam cost drivers because it, it, the, all of these, um, especially the remote exams, uh, would be a reduction in facilities and proctors, uh, while the six sites is uh, basically just a reduction in the number of facilities. So um, Donna mentioned this earlier, these measures do not allow us to fully recover all of the cost in putting the bar exam, but it's clear that we really need to make a concerted effort to reduce costs. And that's what we're trying to do with these options. So any questions uh, you want them to be ready to bring back to us next Wednesday, David? Um, can the bar side David, is your mic on? Sorry, I just had a note that people can't hear you. Is it on? Testing. Oh, there you are. Okay, there you go. Can the uh, bar offices at San Francisco and Los Angeles uh, accommodate all the special accommodation students or applicants? Yes, um, uh, that's one of the, um, oh. We can second. discuss this more on Wednesday at the special meeting, but okay. um, we are using some projections based on what we need to needed to accommodate during the remote exam for COVID. Alex? And just, oh, sorry, David, go Just ahead. one more thing. I just want to throw this out there. Um, National Guard sites are pretty big. They, they can be this, as large as some of these testing centers. Uh, we use throughout the state. Uh, have we ever considered something like that, a California National Guard site? Uh, there, I, I know many of them, I've been many of them throughout the state, and they're quite large, but it is a state entity. That's a great recommendation. I'm into alternative venues. That's why we're here. We're here today. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Alex? Yeah, I, I like all the ideas. Uh, the only comment I have is modality. I certainly understand, you know, two of the four recommendations or models uh, recommend having the essays and the PT administered remotely. But that I don't know. That's within our province to make that decision. I mean, the obvious the Supreme Court ultimately would have that authority. And so I don't want to put the cart put the cart before the horse and say this is what we want to do. But that being said, I would never. Um, Personal opinion. I, I will, knowing the technical limitation of remote exam, I would not recommend um, having essays uh, administered remotely. I mean, it makes sense. Uh, actually, I think it makes more sense to, for 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 us to flip the other way around with the MBE online. But obviously, MBE it's out of our control. We don't have we don't have any authority as far as how it should be uh, administered. But and but I, I do think the PT can be administered remotely. Um, but I, I I just would not recommend the essay be done so in the same format or modality. Okay, any other questions? I, I would uh, point out, Alex, you're absolutely correct. It's ultimately, uh, the administration of the exam is ultimately a decision of the Supreme Court, and the mm -hmm. Supreme Court will, when it issues its order for how the exam is going to be administered, will include this information. This is why we, why we had to sort of hastily schedule a meeting for next week, because the uh, intention is to bring the, the discussion to the Board of Trustees in July so that they can present a recommendation to the Supreme Court. Um, and so your recommendation next week will help inform the board's recommendation, which will help inform the Supreme Court. Okay. Uh, no one else has any questions. I have two. Um, one is that uh, you tell us where the sites will not be anymore. Um, can you just tell us when you come back yeah. where they would be? Yeah, we will unpack each of these with a lot more detail where okay. the sites will be. And then second is, can you show the math that came up with those numbers? And you must have a spreadsheet yes. or something. Mm -hmm. So if we could see that, that would be helpful too. Yes. Uh, Ashley? Uh, question about whether or not this these considerations will be going out for public comment at some point in the future, or is that like so far in the future we're not even considering? No. no. It's, it's unfortunately not scheduled for public comment. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Um, thank you. You're leaning forward, Alex. Is that just because you're leaning forward and not because you want to say something? No. Okay. Thanks. Um, so that's that gives you the direction for next week. It does. Reminder: that's um, it's a Zoom meeting at noon on Wednesday, the twenty eighth. That's right. So, um, see you there. Um, you want me to do the next one? It's Amy with the rules timeline update. Oh, that's right. Next, yeah. um, just real quickly. Sorry. So the rules timeline has been attached to the agenda. I just want to highlight um, what this document uh, uh, notes. Um, it notes a different sets of um, rule proposals that have come to the CBE for consideration. Uh, as you'll see on there, we have the PTLS LOS, it's already happened, testing accommodations, eligibility, special admissions, the registered law schools, and uh, it also shows the path and where we're at um, in terms of the path with each of these sets of proposals. So um, if you look at the document, and I'm not sure, Audrey, if you have it or can pull it up, but the, um, the, the uh, chart starts with the first step that we normally take, and that is identifying volunteers from the CBE that staff could work, on, work with to develop a proposal. That proposal comes to the CBE with a request to um, uh, for to uh, advance this to the board for approval for circulation of a 60-day public comment period. When that item comes back from public comment, it comes to the CBE, and then the CBE then advances that to uh, the uh, board uh, for adoption, and then some of these rules advance to the Supreme Court. Uh, one thing that is important to note here, if you see the lines that are highlighted in that like yellow, is that the board um, only he hears rules considerations only in May and November. So those are the dates that um, we've been targeting. And as you can see here for the June agenda, um, under the June CBE agenda, we had special admissions. You'll see in August, we have registered law school rules, exam administration, and eligibility. Uh, the timeline allows flexibility in the event that the item needs to come back, which is why you'll see sometimes a few items uh, registered more than once. I think, um, for example, uh, for the um, August meeting, we also had special admissions in the event it needed to come back. So um, I, I just want to highlight, uh, this will give you a sense of what's coming down the pike uh, when it comes to the rules, uh, proposed rule sets that are coming. And, um, and see if anybody had any questions. Okay, thank you. So the registered law school rules now are projected to go in uh, next year for the board? Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, um, I wanna do the next one. Um, real, I have a real quick housekeeping. Just, I know we've mentioned it a few times about next week's next special meeting. Um, and then after that, the August 18th meeting um, and second calibration. And then before um, we invite Lisa to come in, I just wanted to yeah. let you know that we'll email everyone about, you wanna visit any of the July bar exam sites. We'll send an email to see um, who of you would like to sign up to visit any of the sites um, for this upcoming exam. Okay, so um, our final news is sad news. And that's that um, EDGE team, Member John Murphy passed away unexpectedly on May 22nd. Um, we've arranged uh, somebody to come in and serve the rest of his term. Um, so the, the work of the EDGE team will be able to continue um, without disruption. Um, but uh, I think we will miss John. I, I know I had a couple chats with him about various um, test questions and I found him to be funny and engaging. It was an enjoyable 10 minutes. I had a couple times with him. Uh, Lisa Cummings, who's probably the State Bar staff member that's worked with him the most, um, uh, also wanted to say a few words about him. Lisa? Thank you, Paul. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to recognize John Murphy and his contributions to the committee's work in the grading and development of the California Bar Exam. John's professional career as an attorney was broad and varied. He worked in private practice with two law firms and then at the California Supreme Court for over 20 years, most closely with Justice Joyce Kennard. He also served as the general counsel for the Veterans Administration in Washington, DC. John started grading the California bar exam in 1988. 
He participated in the grading program uh, continuously from that time, with the exception of six grading cycles, uh, which is not very many for that period of time. Uh, in 2020, we were fortunate to welcome John to a new role on the examination development and grading team, the EDGE team as we call it. As you know, the EDGE team is responsible for nominating and editing the essay questions for each bar exam and for supervising the grading groups for those questions. John had a brilliant legal mind and was a great people person. He approached every situation with openness and a sense of humor. John was a tireless and dedicated member of the EDGE team and made valuable contributions to the grading and development of the bar exam in California, and we will all miss him. Thank you. Thanks. Um, that, unless I'm wrong, concludes our open session. Hmm. Um, so we are going to go into closed session. Um, Devin, when you send the link to the people who are remote, could you send it to me as well? I'll send it. I, I send okay. Um, so it's gonna take us a couple minutes to set that up. Um, meanwhile, those of you um, who cannot be in the closed session, um, give you time to pack up and leave. Uh, we will be keeping this open session Zoom meeting open um, for the purpose of coming back after the closed session con concludes to report um, that we've concluded it. We do not expect to have any reportable actions to announce at that time. Um, but uh, we'll find out uh, for sure when we come back. So thank you all. Thank you, uh, members. Are we live? Yep. Okay. Um, welcome back, folks. Uh, this is Paul Kramer reporting that we have completed our closed session uh, at uh, three fifty-three uh, this afternoon. We have nothing to report from that closed session, so I am going to adjourn this meeting in uh, memory of our former colleague John Murphy, and wish his family. Well, offer them our condolences. So with that, we are concluded. Thank you all.